é que eu boto o celular de lado porque tem um fio plugado nele. Aí eu não consigo apoiar ele assim. É, eu deixo ele ligado. É. Não, mas assim é melhor.
ataque. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening for you watching this broadcast. It happened on June 13th. If you were watching the video, welcome. Or if you're watching it live, it's great to have you here with us in the first edition of Miss Infocon Brazil, held by Lupa in partnership with Hacks Hackers. My name is Luis Fernando Carrão coordinator of marketing and new business of Lupa. Marcela, thank you for being here with me. Let's welcome Miss Infocom Brazil. Let's start. My name is Marcela Duarte. I am product manager at Lupa and Luis and I are going to be with you throughout this morning in many different live events to talk about fight against misinformation in the elections 2022. What a responsibility what a responsibility it's really good to have you here to have the opportunity to talk about the subject to kick start this electoral coverage that begins in august we have already started we who work with the fight against misinformation you know it started a long time ago and the misinfocon is a global movement that seeks to bring solutions on fact checking experience of users in approach on the misinformation in all its possible ways. It's a possibility to talk about different subjects and their impacts on society. We're gonna talk about mental health. We're gonna talk about collaboration against misinformation. We start this morning with this live broadcast and Miss Infocon Brazil goes th through the end of the day with the full program with workshops, a presential event in Rio. If you're watching it live, welcome. If you're watching the recording, if you're going to participate in a workshop, if you have already got the ticket for that, we'll see you later on today. Let's then call the opening of our uh, partners from Hacks Hackers. Yes, they have prepared a video for us to have this opening to welcome and uh, consider Miss Infocon open. And who's going to talk by Hacks Hackers is Connie Munseha. Thank you, Connie. With Welcome to Miss Infocon Brazil. Bem vindo. Since 2017, Miss Infocon events have brought together journalists, technologists, engineers, activists, researchers, and learners to address misinformation across diverse disciplines on many topics, ranging from health and science to elections and media literacy. This is our ninth Miss Infocon since our first days at MIT in 2017, and our third Miss Infocon this year in 2022. Ms. Infocon is a project of Hacks Hackers, a U.S. nonprofit, non-governmental organization whose mission is to advance journalism innovation and online knowledge and ideas through grassroots efforts around the world, especially relying upon local partners' experience and expertise. To fuel more engagement around misinformation globally, we've partnered with organizations such as the Mozilla Foundation, IREX, and more recently hosted panels and workshops at the International Journalism Festival in Perugia, Italy this April. We are delighted to partner with Agencia Lupa to host our Miss Infocon event in a new country, in a new oh, region oh, for us. Is one of Asia. As you will have seen by now, today's Miss Infocon event focuses on collaborations among institutions around the critical topic of elections. We've highlighted contributions from the academic community and tech-centered organizations to support journalists and information verifiers during times where access to credible and verifiable information is crucial. Thanks so much for attending. We hope you enjoy the rest of the program and share the broadcast links with your networks. But most of all, continue to engage with Agencia Lupa and the other organizations represented here today. Let's continue to build those connections and innovate solutions as we all strive for the improved information environment that our citizens and our democracies need. Thank you, Connie. It's really important to hear that speech because it shows we are fighting misinformation in different areas, in different ways. We believe in a collective effort to fight it. If you're watching it live, you want to share, you want to engage more people, use the hashtag MissInfoConBrazil on your Instagram, Twitter, using all of your social networks. And if you want to send this video, send it, comment it. 
if you have a question, your question can be answered. You can comment on the YouTube trans, uh, broadcast. We're going to try and answer the most, the, the greatest number possible of questions. Let me show you our program today for you. Write down the schedule uh, so you don't miss anything. Marcella is not here anymore. She's on the studio next door to get ready for the next panel. The, ne the first panel is on collaboration against misinformation for the elections. And right next with 10.30 a.m., we're going to have a second panel. The second panel is going to talk about a really important issue, which is the mental health of journalists and electoral processes. If we know that the electoral process has everything to be challenging, we must talk about mental health and well-being of collaborators and communicators. And we're not over this morning. We, at the end of the morning, we have an, an academic immersion. We're going to bring the fight to misinformation to other spheres. We're going to talk about the importance of uh, media literacy to uh, form a critical part of society to fight misinformation. We're going to have three researchers to talk more about the research and to present what they have been doing uh, on the theme. Have you jotted down? I'm, I'm going to uh, send now the floor to Marcela Duarte with the first panel of this morning. Thank you for watching. Follow us. Thank you, Luis. We're going to start with panel one on collaboration against misinformation on the elections. <clears throat> we have to open Misinfocon Brazil. We have three special guests. I want to introduce you the journalist Zaur Lara Zomer. She's the general director of Chequeado, the project that Lupa inspires uh, a lot. She's going to share all of her experience with Chequeado, the first organization uh, of uh, fact-checking in Latin America. She's also the creator of LATAM Chequea, the biggest regional network of fact-checking worldwide. Also, Chris, who is the founder of Lupa. We are very proud to say she is the founder of Lupa. Chris is the senior director of the... International Center for Journalists. She founded Lupa, as I have already said, the first uh, uh, agency in Brazil of fact-checking. She was the director of uh, IFCN, the International Network of Fact-Checking between 2019 and 2021, and she coordinated the uh, Coronavirus Fact Alliance, the biggest collaborative fact-checking project in the world. Also, Thiago Rondon, who's here, who is part of the Cybersecurity Committee and the Special uh, Secretary to Face Misinformation in the Superior, Superior Electoral Court. She is the CEO of AppCivic, uh, a consultancy to develop the civic technology projects. This is our first panel of the day. Welcome all. For us at Lupa, the fight against misinformation must happen in, a, in many different ways. It's pointless to work just with journalism or just education. We must have a series of fronts to be able to fight misinformation. In addition to journalism, we have media literacy. Media literacy is a way uh, that will last longer. It will go all the way through the long run. This is the principle of Lupa. There are many other ways to fight misinformation. In all these ways, this wide range must be tackled. All these ways of uh, fighting against misinformation must be collaborative and articulate. And this is going to make this fight be more effective. Collaboration is really important in each area. We brought here Laura and Chris. Laura is going to start with their experience at like yeah. And uh, Chris is, Chago is going to talk about App Civic. I want to start with a round so that each one of them talk about 
this team within their area to talk about the importance of working collaboratively in each one's area. The floor first, Chris, then Laura, then Thiago. Good morning. It's I'm really excited to be here at this event. I'd like to thank Hack Hackers. I'd like to thank they dedicated time to misinformation in Brazil and their dear partners. And I want this to move forward. Marcela, I'd like to take advantage of another 30 seconds to talk and request uh, my colleague Don Phillips and Bruno Pereira. We don't have uh, a whole lot of information on where they are in the Amazon. And also, uh, I'd like to send a hug to Congresso in Foco. They've, they are receiving uh, threats, even death threats, uh, because they're fighting misinformation. With that said, collaboration is the most beautiful thing that fact-checking uh, taught me. We understand when we get into this fact-checking world that the misinformation monster is so big that no one's going to be able to win against it alone. It's pointless to be fighting this alone. Um, in the Brazilian sphere, it started with a lot of uh, clarity in 2016 in, in the elections. I remember for the city halls, we did the first fact-checking pool with a public agency, Truku, at back then, and we did the first draft of collaboration between verifiers. And it's really nice to see how this movement's growing and see that today we have a much bigger and more consolidated structure than in only six years, 16 to 22. We've had collaborations of many different kinds. In addition to what I've mentioned in 2018, we created, I would say, uh, with the, the Superior Electoral Court, oh, the first group of verifiers that uh, actively acted on the elections day. Maybe some of you who are watching us or who will watch us later will remember the verifiers were a group of eight organizations we were active already and worried about misinformation on the day of the elections. And that 2018 edition of this, uh, I don't even think there was a name we thought of check barring. We, we did more than 50 check-ins in 24 hours. I just wanted to give you these figures as a good verifiers for us to, to see the dimension, the volume of misinformation that happens on the day of the elections. And we're talking about 2018. We're talking about two lies each hour. And it's a lot. And it was really nice to do that. And things have consolidated over time. I'm really happy to see Thiago Rondon here. Someone who uh, is fighting. I was almost giving up on bringing the superior court to to this debate uh, since 2016 i saw there was no way of fighting misinformation uh regarding elections without institutional support and the institutional uh concern of the superior court i'm really happy to see this committee here and i put all of my efforts and my knowledge at uh, available to you it's not going to be easy. I would like to take advantage of these initial minutes, Marcella and friends, to talk about the international experience. I have since 2019, I worked, as Marcella said, at International Fact Checking Network, the network that brings together uh, professional fact checkers, fact checkers in the world. And we had the bad luck of facing the pandemic, but the luck to be able to build over this big problem a collaboration that uh, made history, Coronavirus Facts Alliance, is the world's most impacting collaboration in number of participants. Uh, 
uh, fact checking figures, number of people impacted. So in general lines, I'd like to say that verifiers are increasingly more working well in their capacity to exchange information so that they're faster and they have greater impact. The collaboration has this goal to make uh, all of us not do the same fact checking twice. And you can't imagine how interesting it was to see that this information content that emerged maybe in Asia, in Taiwan, for instance, where it uh, the coronavirus facts started, it took weeks until it landed in Argentina from our dear Laura Zomer. And because of the existence of a database where fact checkers worldwide could leave their work there, Laura and other verifiers in Latin America were faster to be able to deliver their, their work to the local public in Spanish. So I, I leave here my invitation for you to visit Coronavirus Facts webpage. We are beyond 16,000 fact checkings. And from this database, we did chat bots, uh, articles, investigations, analytic columns, and there's a lot of material to be seen there. It's the beginning of a global thinking that understands that in journalism that seeks to fight misinformation, there is no competition, there's collaboration. I wrap up my initial collaboration, Marcella, the floor is back to you. Thank you for being, for uh, my being here. I am really excited. Thank you, Chris. It's really important what you said uh, on Bruno Phillips and Bruno Pereira. Uh, Laura, the floor is yours. Okay, we had uh, we had uh, a technical problem with the sound. We're gonna start over. First, I would like to thank my Lupa and Hack Hackers colleagues, and I want to apologize. I'm gonna speak Spanish, not Portuguese, but I understand what you're saying, Portuguese. As I was saying. We've been working 12 years now with fact-checking. It's really clear for us that collaboration is not just an option. The bad actors, those that generate information deliberately to disturb public debate, to affect democratic uh, conversation, uh, it, it, it's harmful and we, deal with uh, voters and they have collaborative strategies they have common strategies which are effective and even uh, repeated for example you must have seen that many times the same message with the small change are shared in hundreds of accounts at the same time to seem that it's something familiar and thanks to bringing this familiarity because we have seen it many times. It's, it, that's an example of how they articulate these people who generate misinformation, their capability. And we fact checkers, as Chris mentioned, uh, many years now, we've been working with different experiences. We had uh, things we've done right, wrong, we have learned and we have better conditions to collaborate in a regional and global way than in the past. We're much better. What have we learned? 
I'm going to talk about the Heverso experience. It's a project of electro uh, collaboration, the biggest one we have, at least now, that we know of. We brought it together in the Argentinian election, the last one in 2019, 120 males uh, brought together, uh, ranging from the most uh, visited web page the, the, to even a meeting with only two journalists in the northern border of Argentina. It's one of the key features we learned on how collaboration must work diverse the most possible uh, the most diverse possible so that we can work with different capabilities different means on different formats different capabilities regarding the tone the way they communicate and also different in their ideology contacts like not just argentina but unquestionably uh, brazil high polarization where one group thinks the other one is capable of just anything and vice versa. It's important for the collaboration to make it, makes it possible for us to, to hear what's happening on both sides ideologically going to the capabilities of what's been said. So it's really important to reach all groups. That's the idea I want to bring and leave here my 5% of collaboration. We think that collaboration must have all effort to be the most diverse possible. The collaborations, the companies, universities, the different formats, TV, uh, radio, printing press, uh, social media, it all helps our capability. The second idea, which has been mentioned before by Chris, is that the fake fact checkers, they know that time matters. The sooner we react, the more chance we have to reduce the negative impact because when, the, when they're sharing a lot, some news, we intervene even in the universities we see that we can stop the snowball of misinformation the curves growing we publish something and people stop sharing that fake content in a systematic way which has been proven in the research i've been talking about i'm talking about the research done in argentina but also a research done in the united kingdom Niger, Africa, many years after. For us, it's really important for collaboration to be diverse, to include several different things, and we also think it's important time. Why am I talking about time? As Chris was saying, in the pandemic, it's really clear that as the virus was advancing, the information that we're misinforming were also in, uh, advancing the virus started in Asia, went to Europe, then the United States, and then came to Latin America. This time, uh, the misinformation took to come here. It allowed us to, when we received the misinformation, we could react much faster. We also learned that there's no collaboration without thinking that it's possible. I have heard this in all continents of this planet. No, in my country, it's impossible because of the system, uh, the pol politics, and because of our leader. It's impossible to have this collaboration. And my answer is, there is no collaboration if we don't try. So a call, very hard call to try and collaborate always. Um, Another thing I would like to call your attention to is to be clear about that collaboration implies giving up. No one that collaborates is going to be is going to have everything the way they want, the way they would do it if they, they were working alone. But still, in the field of misinformation, we recommend, and I would say it's a must 
for us to think of collaboration as something possible, for us to see what's possible and that we know that it's possible to make it and we're going to have to uh, give up. Uh, I would like to propose one of the things that I have learned that for a collaboration to be effective, we must define workflows that makes our lives as easy as possible. What, what do I mean? Many of the media that collaborate in a process against electoral misinformation, there's not just uh, fact checkers or agencies, but other people who are there on daily coverage, the breaking news of the election. So for effectively to have uh, collaboration against misinformation to happen, don't, don't be like, oh, I'm interested. You put your logo there and you stop. You, we, we don't we don't want to say that it's effective we want the content to actually reach in every aspect that we are working on so the learning i want to leave here is that for you to invest time in defining the best workflows to make the daily task easier for each journalist and each voter who are part of this project this is key for a collaboration to be successful our analysis on the successful collaborations, including unquestionably, like Chris said, it was really clear who was doing what, who, who was deciding. So the three ideas are, first, look for collaboration. Don't give up before you start. Know that collaborating, you're going to have to uh, give in, look for adversity, look to be as fast as possible, having the workflows really clear. Don't drive anyone crazy. Uh, don't make any uh, key collaborator abandon, abandon the boat before you reach your objective. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you in this event. It's nice to be here with Chris, which is my colleague for such a long time. And it's so nice to see a great presentation about elections disinformation. And it's important to talk about Headpacker. I've been working with this for such a long time and it can really support the fight against misinformation. I like to try to be the most objective possible and I want to talk about collaboration. I want to talk about how the elections of justice has been or voting justice being doing this since 2018. In 2018 there was no structure for collaboration. I mean nothing formal. Only groups that were acting and they were focusing on the elections and they saw that this was a big problem like when Chris said that there were checkers working on the voting day. So it was really important to see what the checkers did because historically they they had been working and facing that issue for such a long time in Brazil. In 2020, there was a program which, which was issued for the 2020 elections. They started building strategies, no regulatory strategies, but very segmented though. So in 2020, we had 70 partners already and we had a project which was the equalization for check, for fact checking, and we could actually be closer 
in order to offer information and skills to have a channel in which we were more were closer to each other. And for 2022, we not only saw that the collaborative model or pattern works very well, and it's really important, especially because of the moment that we're living right now. And partnerships are key. And now the program has 50, more than 50 partners. And the main goal is to actually preserve the right of all citizens to act according to their rights. And that's why we have agreements with all the political parties, also with religious groups. Also, we made actions, actions that were really good that we did. We started doing 2020 with soccer clubs, soccer teams. They acted with uh, information campaigns and so on. And we noticed that these corporations were really valuable and the impact was very positive in order to really take information or bring good information to everybody. The information during the elections or during the elections uh, time now, for example, we're facing something. And it's important to say that electoral misinformation happens all the time. And it's interesting because it's growing nonstop. It is a challenge that we have all the time. I mean, during the whole time, not only during the uh, election process, but there on the voting day. And this uh, moment of disinformation, we see and we have actions that are different and they demand different skills different abilities for everybody to act. And just to show you uh, briefly, for you to have an idea, as we know, Brazil is a continental country. We have more than 1 million people that work during the voting days. They're at the table receiving the electors. And because of the pandemic, all the process became digitalized or digitized and all these people that work on the voting days, the people that are working there at the tables, they received all the information because those people are there on that day, on the voting days, and they are impact by the negative, uh, negative effects of misinformation. In 2020, we developed a very big network with more than 30 million Brazilians connected with the, those apps and they had access to text messages about all the misinformation and all the fake news. And this year we're also going to have this action going on because we need the presence of the electors. They need to really feed us with all this uh, fake news that they're receiving. We are fighting against this information with these collaborators that are working, more than 2,000 internal uh, collaborators that are actually helping us in this big challenge. But just to give you a, an idea of the digital side of it, we have misinformation or the fight against misinformation we have to do in radio stations, on TV stations to give uh, precise and right information, but we cannot ignore that the digital space in Brazil has been growing so much from the elections of 2020 up to now, more than 30 million Brazilians are connected now, I mean, more than the last time. So they have access to the internet and that brings a very big impact. And some trends are important to be mentioned. There is a trend that the big platforms, nowadays we have 11 digital platforms that we 
you see that millions of Brazilians access every day, they do not have operations within the national territory dedicated in the Portuguese language and in the to the Brazilian electoral process. The second challenge, the second trend, sorry, it's very concerning that we have a misinformation flow within the digital environment that for many times it comes from uh, digital, important digital influencers that are able to use these digital structures or platforms to disseminate very, very fast information on the day of the elections. For example, imagine that some election uh, was uh, canceled. We see this happening severely. Uh, not to mention others that are very uh, damaging too. So what's clear to us is that from 2022 up to 20, from 2020 up to 2022, what we could do is we started building some actions within the administrative uh, sector that it would be really nice to strengthen cooperation. All the platforms have a very clear politics with simple language for the electors and for the candidates in Portuguese. So all of them, they should actually uh, present that. The channels should be uh, able to actually reach, reach the users about the electoral processes and the procedures, how this is going to happen. And the third thing, which is the most important one, is for us to really look for clear data about this information. Because most of the time, you know, these platforms nowadays, they actually act outside our country with people that are outside of Brazil, it's important that checkers, journalists, and many, many players, many actors, they could have access very fast to data, to information, or what's happening in this digital space. We need to bring more information to that. As Laura uh, mentioned very uh, wisely, we have to create workflows among these actors, among these players, to have a healthier field for this uh, public debate. And uh, actually, uh, I don't have more time. I'm going to wrap up. But the most important point of my presentation is in order to have cooperation, according to what Laura said, for these elections, we have to be really able and skilled to have more data, especially in a, in such a big continental country as our country, Brazil, that we have very different scenarios up in the north, the northeast, against the south or southeast of, of, of the country. And all these things can happen. We can scale up this focusing on the 2022 elections if we have more data not only speaking about the digital space, but through uh, research, anything that can happen regarding misinformation. Thank you. That was it. Thanks, Tiago. I'd like to highlight what uh, Tiago said. He spoke about digital influencers. They have a big impact in the digital environment in general. And I think that at work, I see this all the time. Why do we work fighting against misinformation and also with the media education and also fact checking, information checking and so on? We do this because this is a fight that sometimes we see that it's, it's very unfair is that some mechanisms create unfair debates, unfair disputes. When we talk about the elections, we know that this is going to cause 
long years of uh, impact in, in the country's political life. And we have to understand what is the responsibility and the relevance of such work. And just to link with what Tiago said, last week we made a very important decision. The federal election, we kept that the congressman, uh, he was blocked to work because of uh, what happened in 2018 in the elections. That congressman lost his position last October, but the decision was reversed two weeks ago by the minister, Luis Marqui. And, and this actually caused a big imbroglio because of everything that's being said about a conspiracy, a conspiracy theory. What I say conspiracy because nothing was proved that there were there was fraud in the electronic uh, voting system in Brazil. I mean, we work with fact checking and journalism and so on. And I'd like you to talk about you know according to your point of view, you guys work with cybersecurity and with misinformation at the same time. So how do you see this collaboration between different areas? And why doesn't the electoral uh, court of Brazil doesn't work alone? Because this is a very, a very severe debate about fraud um, with this uh, electronic voting system. So how these different areas, the different uh, sites can actually fight misinformation? It's good to say that there is a front and of course the role of the superior voting uh, court, they actually take, take care of that, as you said, They've been suffering. They've been they've been attacked with all the, 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 the decisions that they, they they make. They've been really attacked. And what, what I can uh, comment, I'm not going to speak about that case specifically, but some issues that are recent. The resolution twenty three six seven one. I mean, they added Article nine about sharing fake facts or something out of context that might jeopardize the voting processes and the accounting and so on. And this is a, a regulatory mark and it's a new one. And as we had in 2020, the regulatory mark there too, I see that we've been advancing about regulatory marks, but from the administrative side of the problem, we see that we've also advanced from the last elections to now, the big platforms have a clearer politics about these uh, issues. And there are two, I'd say, preparatory fronts. But another issue that I see about the electronic uh, ballots. It's a very important part of the electoral process that includes other points. We see it's our duty among all the partners that collaborate together. We need to speak more about each stage of the Brazilian electoral system. We need to talk about formats, about languages, we need to look for digital influencers to explain each detail of the process. I think one of the axles of our problem is focusing in informing and skilling a large number of players. Recently, 
we had a very important safety public test with the biggest number of registered people. It, it was a very big action for the last years, opening, for instance, the, the source code. We opened a political announcements or political advertising a, a library. And that's really nice. I mean, all these actions are happening. There is uh, other things going on too. And just to make the long, long story short, we have the regulatory marks, why not? We have new politics for the platforms and the role, the institutional role that we have to bring more information about the, the voting process, the electoral, the elections process. We need to do this all together with all the partners that we have. We have more than 150 partners uh, working together. Excellent, Thiago. I'm going to ask you to comment on collaboration in different areas, different agencies, affect factors. And he also mentioned religious institutions. I'd like uh, Laura and Chris to comment based on their experience with Latam, Shekeya, Reverso, in the case of Laura. And if Chris would start on the importance of having collaboration, not just in one area, but collaboration with different areas. I cannot hear Laura, no sound from Laura. Just a moment, please. We're waiting for the sound. Well then, I was saying that a very important aspect I'd like to recover from what Thiago has said, the key of each electoral process not just in Brazil, but the entire region. We must work for big platforms, uh, governments who are uh, working with different strategies, also with international organizations, diff different strategies against misinformation. They should pay more attention to misinformation in different languages other than English, the investment done to fight to deal with misinformation in English and in our languages is unequal. I say that going back to the question you made on collaboration, not just among journalists, regional journalists, but also other players and, and, and link it to the academic world. We have very few academic research bringing evidence on the best strategies to end with misinformation in this context and in other languages other than English, which is about uh, everything related to pushing academic research and more uh, conclusions on the practices that we must adopt. This, this is vital. It's also vital and maybe at this point, uh, having this conference uh, held by hack hackers, uh, it, uh, for journalism to include technology, the, the, uh, the, the journalistic teams worldwide already have this sort of work with engineers, uh, data visualizers and other profiles, which are not necessarily traditional journalism, and I must say that it's key to work with technology that allows all information work, to, to mainly work in two areas, to detect narratives which could bring misinformation. And when I talk about misinformation narratives, we know that usually they use 
the, the players that generate misinformation don't work just with isolated pieces, but many times way And the biggest articulation with the uh, universities, technolo technology world, and third, but not least, I have been repeating for a long time, we have explored with the world of influencers, Instagrammers, that's key for me to work in the misinformation world with players that could be singers, social leaders or people that citizens listen to and believe in them, the, the, the electoral courts, the democratic institutions in our countries are suffering a crisis of legitimacy and reliability while we work and how to solve this huge crisis uh, on credibility we must associate with those people the citizens listen to, pay attention to. I am not afraid to associate with or to have associations with artists, singers, sculptors. Au contraire, all of them can contribute to, to get farther away with this technology in this fight against misinformation. We, we must put together our army of fact checkers and we must have different positions in this army in addition to betting on media education so that any citizen can see what's right, uh, what's fake, what's true. And the universe of elections, there are things that are so easy to check. White votes annul the elections. Like these things are so easy to check that this small army we are trying to build in schools, universities, it can be of great value at this moment. I'd like to validate two points that Laura mentioned. I think it's really important to bring to collaboration guys from technology, information, engineering, design. We are talking about a world that just the written text, just journalism itself, it, it won't be able to handle it. We have an example I followed from a distance. Uh, the work from Lupa with community radios, for instance, and the university radios, we were able to build this huge network of distribution to check uh, facts that was done. Okay, okay, I'm back, I'm back. I'm going to say it again. So the university and community radios network has an impact that we can't imagine in the large centers. Brazil has a, a lot of news already identified and for these areas, we must take the fact checking, uh, a movement that brings together technology design with the community radios would have a huge impact in Brazil. In the case of uh, influencers, I I subscribe to what she said, and we are living a crisis of credibility in journalism. Some people don't believe the Earth is round, so we must people to say that the Earth is round, and all of a sudden things uh, get 
a, 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 a tone of uh, truth, truthness. There can't be competition between influencers and journalists. There must be a composition. I also like to mention uh, the work of an organization that has been working to bring together influencers from several different sectors, mothers, young people, politicians, singers, uh, about the need to fight misinformation. This work is it's really uh, urgent work. We cannot wait and we have to rely on all these strengths. I would like to recommend for all of those who are watching us to, to watch, I think, Reverso the alliance that Laura built in Argentina over the last elections has good example on how collaborations can have an impact. Look for uh, this on the internet, a video that clearly is a deep fake. It is a manipulated, put together, made by Reverso, in which you see the face of uh, president con candidates doing funny things and Laura can talk about this i understand it was the uh, something that was made by tv channels and different media to alert citizens that uh, uh, things that citizens receive even if it looks real can be fake so the awareness the alarm system it's really important it's the previous step to fact check, and we must tell people that they are target of misinformation, even though they don't want it, even though they think they are somehow protected from that. The less level of collaboration. And I, a round of applause to Tiago's work at the Superior Court. We must involve all platforms. It's impossible to fight misinformation with the explicit work help of social media and text message uh, apps. In this space, misinformation is spread. It's in these spaces they become live and they, they go from a lie to a parallel reality. So it's impossible to just talk about facing electoral misinformation without being together with Meta, Twitter, Google, Telegram, WhatsApp, Spotify. It's really important for people in Brazil to realize the small work that has been uh, done by the Committee on Misinformation to bring all these platforms. And I believe Brazilians know in detail the effort to, that was to bring Telegram to the table for them to commit what they policy that is interesting for the country for our electoral reality in our language and that their platforms their apps improve the user experience so that it's easier to uh to flag misinformation and easier to receive true information and i i wrap up my second comment highlighting that we need engineers, uh, IT technicians, professors. We need university people uh, in, in media literacy, marketing people, advertising people, the TV channels, the community and university radios. We need platforms. It's much bigger than just fact checkers. The, alone, they cannot carry this load. I think we have lost her again and now she's back. I am sorry. I just wanted to say that, that it's impossible for us fact checkers to carry all this load alone. We need help from all these groups. It's, a, it's such a heavy load. Right. I, I wanted to take advantage. You all talk about the platforms. I wanted to highlight that it's necessary to work with platforms in a very transparent way. In the case of Telegram, we are still waiting to see what effective measures they're going to take. And 
Remember that we at Lupa and all other agencies of fact checking are, are signatories of uh, the fact checking agreement. We work with principles. We must work with transparency. I'd like to go back to a few things you all have said. You talked about platforms. Chris commented on the Lupus project with the radio uh, community raiders and university raiders and Laura talked about something really important to pay attention to misinformation in other languages other than English. So the three things are connected. Why is it important to bring uh, verified information through community and university radios to people. Of course, we know the level of internet use, cell phones, smartphones in Brazil is very unequal, but people in general, most people use apps, receive messages on the cell phone, but may, most, many of these people don't have access to the internet in such a constant or intense way as we in large urban centers have. It's important to understand that the specificities of each place, the more we are always looking outside to different experiences in the United States, Europe, different places, we must look in different places in Latin America and look inside Brazil for us to actually be able to reach a larger number of people. What Chris was saying, regarding university and community radios. It was really important because of that, we were able to, through this collaboration with the radios, we were able to bring checked information to places. We know it's really hard for Lupa to get. So in a collaborative way, we brought the information to places where lots of times it's, it's a desert of news. The only way information that is checked reaches this place is through this community radio. In the small town in the countryside, it's the initiative from a person that through a cell phone can broadcast information in a community radio. This is really important to work, pay more attention to misinformation in other languages, not English. This is really important. The platforms need to be more sensitive regarding this issue. So I, I made my comment. Chris, Laura, and Thiago, I am going to ask you to ask questions to each other. Do we have a volunteers to start or do you have any questions? Chris, the first one to raise your hand. Thank you, Marcela. I'd like to know from Thiago if he could talk about the commitment of platforms one by one on the fight against misinformation, if he could update the news regarding what's <clears throat> been done and what's is still pending. And we need to pressure where can we help the superior electoral court to work with different platforms? Oh, well, there are 11 platforms. I'm going to try to be brief. I want to explain the workflow, like Laura talked about. I'm going to talk about this regarding the platforms. The court doesn't make any demands regarding the platforms. First, we call a term of uh, compliance. We have a starting point. It's an agreement to have this con point of contact. It's a first thing for us to debate our concerns regarding the electoral process. The second instrument, and they're all public, it's a memorandum of understanding. We did, we released the last one in February for many different platforms with concrete actions from the platforms. And then based on talks, 
and over time we have new additions which are signed they're all public so that everyone knows the commitment of each platform within uh, what they do in Brazil. I'm going to highlight a few briefly. Meta, for instance, developed an action, has been developing a series of actions which are interesting from a product standpoint. We have an electoral uh, schedule. We had the update of voting cards, a lot of misinformation based on the young people focusing on people or those over the age of 70. Facebook implemented a few things with their interface, like a phone. Uh, there was impact on over a uh, hundred billion people on how to do it the proper way. There was an impact on many access that we had on uh, the voting card service updates. So in a sense, we learned that when we have the platforms close to us and working so that we can innovate on the product as well, we have a big impact. COVID, like you were saying, uh, we learned many interesting things when the platforms uh, work with the product as well. I would like to answer a different question that was made regarding the Portuguese language. The Portuguese language, since we are in a continental country, we are isolated with our language in the continent as well as Lots of times we have difficulty to uh, do innovations in the product. I see that we uh, work little by little. When I talked about the policies, the platforms, they didn't have uh, in Portuguese, not even for the candidates, what to do, what not to do. Now we see policies since 2020, interesting for the uh, Brazilian context and civic uh, aspects from Twitter. It's a very clear policy they call strikes. The punishment when people do things, how to do it, what not to do it, really transparent to offering a, a database which is really transparent. So Twitter has something in this sense. Telegram, for instance, there was an agreement we recently disclosed it's a space that is growing a lot in Brazil since the elections in 20 to 22. It's a platform that last year was one of, one of the platforms that grew the most and we built together with them a channel to bring official information in the space and they have a few proposals they have uh, told us that they're going to do like uh, marking posts that at least that's their commitment to have independent agencies to fact check to help in this task our search is for platforms to tell everyone what they're doing we don't have the capability to say that but what i see as the most important for this year what we need is to work more for collaboration here the platforms first for them to build agreements with relevant national players to fight misinformation. They must build, work together for that. And second, a number of initiatives that have data. We need data. Without data, it's really hard to face uh, anything in a country as big as Brazil. Laura, Thiago. Well, I'd like to make a question to Chris, but before asking the question, we spoke about how to integrate all these players 
you know, in order to help us with dancers, artists, singers. It's important that all these collaboration processes are able to listen. They have to be good listeners. In order to fight the misinformation, we have to see what are the questions that people have. You know, all the emptiness that people have about their questioning. And this is vital. This is key for all the, all the uh, information processes, everything that we have, either in the public sector, such as in journalism and so on. We have to think about a flow in order that citizens should be able to say, I don't understand it. Is this true? Is this false? And I myself feel anxious because I understand part of their saying, not all. And in this sense, I need to mention that in Latin America, we have this problem. There is a new project being made in the United States, which is called, it's Czech. And we started with a colleague from Spain. And basically what we're doing is we're trying to really put all these efforts together about fighting the misinformation in Spanish that happened that occur in the United States. It's important to say that this is not a problem of the North or the South, but it has to do with all the misinformation issues that is happening in English or even Spanish in the United States. There is a lot of Latin, Hispanic people in the United States, people that only speak Spanish in the United States. They consume information in Spanish and only two uh, fact-checking agencies produced information in Spanish in the United States. So there should be a space where people not only receive information, but they can actually post their questions and say, listen, I don't understand what you're saying. But Chris, I have a question to you regarding the Brazil's uh, election that you're, you guys are having this year. Since we live in the United States, what do you think, Chris, as Brazilian? Is there anything that you've seen in the United States of America that, I don't know, kind of like, kind of like rings a bell to you in Brazil or some other countries? Well, dear Laura, thanks for your question. And in reality, there's something that is not only similar to what happens, but my biggest fear is that misinformation will bring us to a anti-democratic episode in Brazil, such as what happened with Capitolio this year in January. What we see now in, uh, in America that they've been doing in the Congress and so on, you know, with all the conclusions that because of that, the capital you attack, they've been taking actions and it's more and more evident how the misinformation was key to take all, the, you know, those thousands of people to that, that garden in front of the capital. I mean, it's interesting to see all the interviews, the testimonials of these people, you know, the old keepers, those people, the, the, the very Nazi groups, and uh, they even said that how they were, were uh, brought or they were persuaded to go there to see it because they, they, they heard that the voting was not being computed the right way, you know, the, the results and all the, the bad and fake news saying that the elections were not the desire of the American people and so on. I am scared 
I assume, because I'm going to be fearful up to the beginning of November because I see a lot of similarity, even in the, in the speeches of important celebrities and politicians that insist in, in, in highlighting that because there is a, a, a reliable history about the, the ballots and so on. You know what I mean? So even this week is to see that this information feeds anger, they feed hate and offline movements that are, yes, anti-democratic. We're speaking about a very democratic country uh, differently than Brazil that has been democratic for the last 40 years only. So yes, it scares me. And I ask the Brazilian authorities, the Brazilian delegations that really see that very closely, what's happening in the, uh, the American Congress, uh, what happened about the risk that we face because we're taking the same bets. Well, God willing, and if the checkers are able to do, and I hope so, we will not have any invasion such that happened in Catholic in Brazil. But it's it's really key that we speak this very very openly. But we have to be ready in case anything like that happens. Thanks, Chris. Thank you very much. And that situation was horrible, and and it's important to 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 say that all the time. Thiago, what do you think? Thiago, let's use you as a journalist that you are. Well, um, I'd like to ask Chris, as well as to, to Laura, about the elections. We should be we should be observing the elections processes, you know, closely. Can you guys say any? Thing about good practice and I mean what we should be doing from now on well I can start mentioning some and Chris please interrupt me there is a good experience maybe you even know about the Mexican presidential elections there is a collaborative project called uh, MX, and they worked with uh, the Mexican National Direction. They worked very well. I mean, of course, there are some particularities because they really deal only with uh, elections. But there are four or five uh, items that are fundamental. The first thing is to have a contact, a person, a person that should be there in case of some urgency. It's important to, to have the checkers um, close to the election delegations because the courts are open from 7 a.m. to 1 p.m. And the next day, you know, it's important to, to be there. We have to have a 24 hour phone line in case we have any information, anything to be disseminated, any urgent thing. This is number one. Number two, just like what Tiago said, we have to identify previously, you know, early, all the emptinesses, all the, ta the, 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 uh, the problems sometimes that we have, you know, in order to disseminate, disseminate in, in interesting information or even fun information. We don't have to be so serious because the, if you had some changes in the elections and in any uh, new laws for the elections in Brazil, this can be also source for misinformation. So the election delegations, they should work together with journalists, with designers, with influencers, with uh, advertisers. You know, I think that's important. And I'd like to pass uh, the word to Chris, but I think these are some points that I comes to my mind. Well, Thiago, 
a good practice that we saw happening in, in Mexico, I had uh, the opportunity to know their, um, you know, national elections, uh, movements and so on. And the work that they did with the platforms, and I'm sure that Brazil is actually taking some tips from Mexico right now, but I'd like to say that to, to superior election uh, court in Brazil, something that didn't work in the last uh, British election, for instance, the political parties adopted check, uh, checkers of profiles. We saw that happening in social media. We saw the political parties exchanging their logos or their profiles, their avatars, kind of like showing that there was a kind of like a fact check uh, account and trying to say that all the information was was uh, true. But that was kind of uh, ridiculous because the British people didn't know what to do. You know, they were attacked by that. Also, I'd like to mention the French elections where we saw the power of money, you know, the economic uh, uh, force uh, throwing a lot of hashtags you know, candidates that were nothing, they uh, they actually became, they, they became uh, celebrities, you know, and it's important for us to see that the economic power makes sense still for this information. With money, people can promote, in appropriate hashtags, even promoting candidates that didn't mean anything. It's obvious too that the last uh, elections in India, it was very evident how the technology though can really serve one political party itself. There was a distribution of cell phones asking for people their personal data data to segmented uh, campaigns, political campaigns, and even connected to all these promises that they were pretty much distributing among the population, you know, these elections. So the British elections, the French elections, and the Indian elections, uh, as opposed as the Mexican one, we haven't seen the technology happening so much, you know, for for vote manipulation in Brazil, in, in raw, who haven't seen the economic power actually really fighting strongly to create candidates or to promote candidates that were nothing before. So the political parties actually, they, they went out in, in drag, you know, they, they transformed in checkers. They actually, own a space that was supposed to be neutral and they became that as a kind of like a political party space and that was really really uh dangerous well it, it's important to to be aware of that well well thank you for your contribution ladies very nice ladies that you brought these different, different experiences about other countries. And it's important for all here in Brazil be aware, especially us here at uh, Agência Lupa or Lupa Agency, we should be really uh, conscious about all these problems. Actually, before wrapping up this first panel, I have uh, two minutes and I'd like you ladies to actually wrap up a minute each. Well, briefly, Marcela, I'd like to thank Laura because Laura was always a, a, a great uh, representative of the Latin American people. And she's a great friend of mine too. Chago is a dear friend of mine too. We've been fighting together, right? Chago, it's so nice to have you working with the uh here with the superior uh election court actually putting all together all this uh, collaboration so it's really nice to 
and I, it's great. and Marcela, this event is beautiful. Thank you for you, Luis, and all the Lupa team to put all the, to put this event together. It's very impressive to see our, how our country, Brazil, is gaining international attention, and these elections this year uh, is a. Uh, 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 is so important for the whole Latin America continent and people far away from Brazil are concerned about what's happening in Brazil and what will happen. Thank you, Hack Hackers, and, and, and you guys can count with us from Hack Hackers too. Well, in my case, I also want to thank you for giving the opportunity of sharing some of the things that we've been learning, we've been working on all these uh, years, and it's good to, to, to tell you what we did with the, the checking agencies. And, uh, you know, the, the, the checkers that are the organizations of 16 countries, and we're always looking for support strategies during your elections processes. We're here to help, we're willing to help. We know that these elections will be crazy about misinformation, such as the last election, which was the, mis the election through the WhatsApp. You know, I mean, this is what happened last election. So let's not be uh, unready, let's be prepared and we, you can count on us as your support uh, team for anything, technical uh, help and so on. And also the panel of, uh, about mental health of journalists and social actors. Please count on us because we're willing to help you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Agência Lupa. I really like you, and it's been great to organize this event. I've been actually seeing all the work that Lupa is doing. And last week, I saw the new site, uh, new, new website of Lupa, which is really cool. It's such a pleasure to be here with Chris. I really admire Chris. Chris is a pioneer. She is somebody who's always dedicated and involved in all, all these things. And Laura, whom I met some time ago, you know, she really works with uh, the elections. So maybe Laura can leave her contact and everything. So, and, and, and also she can maybe share her article about uh, fact checking, focus on elections. So these elections is something that we all worry about because we want the conscious and democratic vote. This is not a work only of the electoral justice or the Supreme uh, Court, but it's a work of everybody that looks for something transparent or fair election and so on. Thank you guys, thank you. Thanks, all of you. I'd like to thank you immensely, Chris, Laura, and Tiago. It's such a pleasure to share this morning with you three. And we're going to have a break. And we come back in five minutes. So let's drink some coffee, have water, and let's come back in a few to see, to watch panel number two. We're going to be talking about mental health for journalists. Thank you, guys. I'll see you after the break.
Eu espero que você tenha recarregado a energia, pego uma água e já I esteja pronto para o segundo painel de hoje. Back full of energy, ready for the second panel. I want to remind you, if you weren't here for the first panel, it's okay. The first panel on misinformation on the elections is going to be available for you to watch whenever you want, how many times you want. As soon as we wrap up the broadcast today, it will be automatically available at this same link. And now the second panel of the day is on the mental health of journalists and electoral processes. I am excited, well, not excited because it's not a positive subject, but I'm hopeful regarding what's going to be said here in this panel. And I'm going to uh, say that we are having a lot of positive comments Uh, hello to Cristiano, Sergio Gucci, Guilherme Valadares, Pedro Viana, who have commented. If you have any comment, any questions, send through the broadcast comment area or on your social media using the hashtag Missinfocon Brazil. Presenting our second panel, Chico Baresi is ready and the floor is with you, Chico. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, we don't have the sound for Chico. We've had a small technical problem. I'm going to let him know. Chico, you were mute. I'm going to ask you to reconnect. And I believe this is going to work now. Chico, with you now. Well, meanwhile, let me tell you a little about Miss Sinfocon. This is the first time it's been held in Brazil. Miss Sinfocon is a global movement for us to bring solutions to fight misinformation on fact checking. Um, it started at nine this morning, June 13th. It will uh go throughout the day with a hybrid program on the afternoon we're gonna have workshops if you bought your ticket to participate we'll wait for you this afternoon and by the end of the day we have a presential event in rio de janeiro we're here the entire lupa team is here for us to hold uh this moment of to uh, talk to have new perspectives to see how the elections coverage is going to happen in 2022 and the main challenges we see ahead of us i see chico has audio now let me check now the floor uh, the technical team let me know what's happening okay i am going Can you hear me now? Chico, with you. Great. I apologize for the technical difficulties. We are starting now the second panel of the day. We're going to talk about uh, mental health of journalists. We have a heavy routine. It's hard for us to deal on this job many times. We have uh, Talita here, who's worked in the coverage of politics in Brasilia. And also we have Guilherme Valadares. He is a researcher on this topic. So the impact that journalists have on mental health. The other guest has COVID, couldn't be here. So let's start with you, Talita. You worked on Bolsonaro's little fence. And do you feel something has changed in the journalist coverage with politicians in general? something new, something bad in this coverage. Talita, can you hear me now? I am sorry, I think it's working now. Great. 
Hello, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for the invitation. It's great to participate in this discussion. It's really relevant in a year like this, electoral year. Thank you, Shiko, answering your question. I felt a big difference. I had done other electoral coverages, and the coverage of the 2018 elections brought an additional challenge to the coverage, which was the mental health issue, how to deal emotionally with lots of attacks that were coming both online from social media or personally. It uh, changed a lot with social media. The, the previous panel, people were talking about the role of uh, social media, the companies on the fight against misinformation. This is all linked to what we are going to discuss in this panel. I think a good part of these attacks come from social media, which is confusing and very new somehow for us. Not so new, but recent. And in 2018, it was really recent. And I felt that there was a difficulty from journalists, from companies on how to work with this in the work environment, how to add this extra layer of difficulty in a routine that, as Chico said, it's, it's hard already. We're always working with a strong layer of stress in the electoral time. Journalists work longer hours with more pressure. It's really intense. Um, one of the points I would mention regarding the difficulty is how I protect myself despite the attacks how people feel uh, less exposed. There's uh, a program, not just in Brazil, but a, a plan from some political groups to destroy the biography of journalists trying to invalidate uh, uh, through whatever a journalist have said, done, trying to diminish the, the worker. And it involves the individual, the journalist is attacked in the personal level, the vehicles are attacked. And and how is this dealt with? I see a few things have advanced from 2018 to now. I am not in the coverage this year. Uh, throughout this period, I gave myself some vacations, but we are still way behind what must be worked uh, in this relationship between the individual, the professional, with the company. People are attacked because of their individuality. The criticisms are directed to people, to the name, Talita Fernandes or any other. People are also attacked because of the company they work for, the, their name tags. The target lots of times is the company, but who is in the forefront is the reporter. I think what must be clearer for the reporter to work with more security and for the company to protect itself is a clarity in how these attacks are going to be dealt with, how the reporter is going to feel protected. Eventually, the if people are attacked by the physical attributes, it happens with women, but not just women. People are going to be attacked by their origin, their family relationships, place where they have already worked. How is the company going to deal with that? Legally speaking, because lots of times you have to go to court and how to validate as professionally speaking that the reporter must feel safe. We're going to talk, uh, you talked about the little fence from the government. We see that I and other colleagues felt observed and, and filmed as if we were doing something illegal in our work. And uh, that with the uh, support of politicians, more specifically in the campaign of President Bolsonaro, there was a support of the politicians that were surrounding the, the, the little fence, the, the unex Lorenzoni congressman supported, he said, all reporters are going to make questions to our captain, monitor the work of these journalists. Uh, that creates an environment of uh, insecurity, is an extra layer of stress reporters are going through. Um, asking a question, I have to deal with the supporters uh, that can yell at me, 
uh, fail me, ridicule me. And the reporter is not doing anything that's illegal, just asking a question, which is his job. And that, that grew all the way through the Bolsonaro's little fence area, which is a really bad thing for the political debate, which matters to the work of journalists, which is to the work of the reporter, the, the coverage, the presidency of the republic. We have to ask authorities, the president, the actions that are being done by the government. And in that environment, there wasn't really space for questions in the public domain. It was more of a, a space where things were replicated by the president and his supporters as if a stage, like a fight between journalists and the president. And that is really harmful for individual, for the, the reporters there as far as their mental health and really bad for journalism. The role played by journalism it strengthens the way this narrative is built by the president and his supporters as a narrative. See, that they're against me. And it's not about that. Our work has always been to question authorities, whoever they are, whoever political party they belong to. And no one was used to this kind of environment. The social media were not so broadly used in previous administrations and elections. This was, it took a long time uh, to, to companies understood that the physical and mental security of reporters was threatened in that little fence. And there was a decision after a long time and a lot of talk that there would be no longer, they, they wouldn't have any coverage anymore. And, and this is still happening and it's going to be present in the elections this year, whether it's uh, President Bolsonaro or other candidates. It's a practice. Supporters are filming, exposing people, and this has to be worked. And I have to say this has grown a lot in the actual administration since his campaign to the presidency. Thank you, Talita. I'd like to talk about this relationship. So let's talk about how delicate these situations are. It's something that has been internalized yet or you, you don't think so? Thank you for the question, Shiku. Good morning, Shiku. Good morning, Talita. Good morning, everyone who's listening to us. Luis, uh, thank you for the invitation to be here. I'm really happy to be here in this talk. I am touched listening to Talita. We have talked a little bit before, uh, listening to uh, reports which are similar. I'd like to talk about my trajectory in this field, uh, mental health and journalism, to directly answer what you were talking about, Chico. If it's internalized in... Uh, newsrooms or not, 2013, 2014, I got a scholarship called Journalist of Vision, and I, I researched mental health throughout the world, the impact that, the emotional impact that news generate on people, the ways we can keep our emotional balance individually and structurally looking at journalism and newsrooms and also for those who are not working inside like freelancers i am going in depth looking at this i have uh done a few works i am providing uh workshops on this at folha de sao paulo and outside uh, newsrooms with partnerships with uh uh, different institutions, bigger ones like Meta, Google News. In newsrooms, I don't see this is internalized yet. It's a debate that is shy. Fortunately, it is growing. Uh, Pre-pandemic, it, it was uh, really slow. It sped up the talk regarding mental health the levels of anxiety grew on many areas in journalism, maybe more than other areas. They research from Finagi, according which 61% of Brazilian journalists state their anxiety 
the state of mental health has uh, gone bad throughout the pandemic. And so we have to raise this conversation and mainly we have to support it. It's a key aspect. There's no way uh, a speech is going to do magic or a, a two-day workshop is not going to do magic. We need something more continued. Within newsrooms, we have to work three pillars, culture, protocols, and training. Culture in the sense of how can we make mental health a priority? It is, is it possible to make rigorous quality journalism having mental health as a baseline, a first degree, or is that impossible? That's an interesting question to investigate. Protocols come together with a process of emotional literacy. If someone is showing a burnout uh, framework, can I see that? Can the person recognize that? Can people in the newsroom, in the leadership areas, recognize it? They, do they know how to deal with that? Is there a protocol? He is uh, in burnout. He, he needs uh, some days off, a psychiatrist, something adequate for the, the person's situation. It shouldn't be an option if you are in a state of burnout to keep on working, lots of times causing severe problems to yourself and your co-workers. He's more vulnerable. So everything is related to protocols, financial support, logistic support. How do we deal with situations like Talita said uh, regarding the little fans? Uh, how do we deal with not just with the political coverage, but many other coverages which are really complicated? And training is regarding uh, having a continuity process to offer speeches, spaces to share, to have uh, emotional literacy for the newsroom as a whole, to learn how to speak this language, for us to have more open uh, sharing, not to live a culture of silence when the subject is mental health. Specific research I have done with a small sample, a bit over 200 journalists, a small sample, if I remember well, it was a bit more than 70% of the journalists said they agreed that there is a culture of silence when the subject is mental health. 23% said, I don't know, which I thought was symptomatic. Almost one fourth don't even know what to say when they're asked about a subject that is not so uh, addressed. So I am excited to talk a bit more uh, about this. Thank you. I'd like to ask you two on social media. On the one hand, a lot of people use social media and journalists must be in social media. It's an important part of public space. On the other hand, it's a place uh, that is really susceptible to attacks. What kind of measures can be taken to, to do your job and at the same time protect yourself and protect your mental health? Can I start? Thinking about my own experience, my talks with the, my co-workers who are still working, I am a bit away from the Brazilian coverage. I, I think they need support. One of the, I like, Guilherme talked about culture protocols and procedures training. So one important culture is to have this awareness, knowing how to identify the reporters and uh, talks from leaders to reporters trying to understand and notice the signs that something can be going wrong. There must be a culture of rest 
this is so difficult in journalists for many different reasons. The crisis of the sector, the press, we have less and less professionals, so they are subject to longer hours, more exhausting hours. That We are connected all the time, receiving information from sources or the competition. So there's a push to be always seeking information, but there must be a culture to encourage people to rest. They need to pause. They need to breathe. They must have quality of life because that has an influence in the quality of their work. It's an important issue to identify when there are problems and at the same time avoid problems from happening. And that needs pause, rest, the elections period. People are really connected 24 hours, but that needs to be changed. It's a cultural issue in newsrooms. People are crazy working. It's impossible. And protocols, for instance. How to react when you are attacked. There are many ways a reporter can be attacked. It can be directly by an authority like we have been seeing. Well, I'm talking about President Bolsonaro. It's the most evident one. And still, even though historically journalists have been attacked by presidents, congressmen, ministers, we have a recent case of Rubens Valente, for instance, on being sued by a work is done for the ministry of the, the minister of the Supreme Court. We're talking specifically about the elections and the scenario. I think has changed a lot with the cur current administration. I insist on this saying that it's not just that, even though it's not all equivalent, but on the protocol. There must be, we must create a protocol. It's not trivial for a reporter to be attacked many times live with the press room being broadcast live on TV and social media. How to react? There's no easy answer. And they, with a full emotional load, each person reacts in a different way. You're going through different things. Person acts in a different way. That's why we need a protocol to provide security for the reporter and the company. And a lack of a protocol brings insecurity. And I have seen many times reporters being attacked and do not receive support from the company in the sense that, of course, the company is concerned. They have a name to protect, but there's a protocol for the reporter to feel secure, protected. And if there's a problem with their working, that they must they must talk later. An attack can never be accepted, no matter what happened, no matter what kind of question was made. An attack should never be accepted. That's important. And we also need a protocol for digital media. Chico talked about journalists using social media a lot to promote themselves, to promote their work. Companies use social media to promote their work and the work of their journalists, but it's through this means that a lot of attacks come. I have been attacked. I have been threatened through social media. And there's always the issue. You don't know if it's real or not in social media, but whether it is a robot or a person, someone made the programming for that. That must be taken seriously, even though the threat may seem abstract. And there must be protocol, including as far as security of information, the reinforcement of password, cell phone protection for the journalists, protection for their uh, computers, encryption. There's There are many tips and issues that IT professionals have been talking. Uh, my experience is that People are careless about this, not even with their own security, with the newsroom emails. There, so there's a technology issue regarding the support. This is an important protocol, including the procedures, the procedures that must be taken and the protocols when an, an attack happens, what you do. Eventually, uh, setting a reporter aside from a coverage, if you see his physical mental health is threatened, how to provide support. Guilherme talked about the financial aspect. It's really important to ensure a health 
plan that provides this physical and mental support for the professional to have people within the newsroom and also having the support from uh, physicians so that the professional feels protected uh, so that he can deal with eventual trauma, things that must be worked. And social media aspects really complicated. We were talking about protocols on companies and I think there's not enough being done in technology companies regarding the protection of journalists. It takes a long time or sometimes the information uh, are not even deleted when they're not real criminal content. There's always a fear of colleagues to let uh, people know when their lies being spread, when they have uh, family information, email address, phone numbers being leaked. And I think the platforms are doing very little regarding this. And they, we need companies to get in touch. Maybe journalism companies, we should get together and talk and provide a broad protocol on clear policies with the technology platforms on how to uh, stop the spreading of uh, harmful information, of sensitive information that can expose the lives of people. Commenting a bit about this, I agree fully with you, Talita, starting with the platforms. I, I work in partnership with them lots of times, but I criticize them a lot. They must create, uh, they created mechanisms to get us addicted and we deal with the consequences of this in many different layers. When we look at social media, it's interesting to see that how a group of journalists is literate enough to see the damage there. We may suffer a primary damage. We are really exposed to an event we feel is putting our physical integrity or emotional health at risk. If we interpret that we are at risk, physical, emotional, that can be traumatic. Of course, and different people will interpret what's traumatic in a different way, depending on our past, our history, our social markers, gender, race, social class, what makes me a, an individual, my identity, what can be traumatic for me can be really different. And there's a secondary trauma as well. What is a secondary trauma? I simply deal with a first trauma of other people or being exposed to a, a coverage that is sensitive, that is heavy, that can be traumatic for me. Even if I am dealing only with pictures, uh, reports, videos, without having direct contact with that event, that can be traumatic. Through social media, I can also see myself professionally in the context of uh, moral injury, uh, uh, being doing something that is moral or ethically that I don't agree, I don't support. I can be exposed in a context. I'm going to be called to uh, do an interview or check something in a way I don't see a fit. Let me give you a pre uh, an example of this moral issue. I was talking to a journalist doing a uh, uh, policy, uh, police coverage. He had a critical view of the police action in the vehicle he was acting. He could not say that. He could not have a critical coverage of the police. For him, it was an ethical problem to do police coverage without being able to criticize the police. That could be a, a, a framework of that. When we're looking at social media, an interesting metaphor is to think that many times that's an environment that is not healthy. Imagine something like professionals that go to coal mining uh, underground, removing rocks and it's a, an unhealthy profession with lots of professions and high risks involved. I think we could work with this understanding. Using social media as a regular user, now as a journalist, maybe it could be something like if you have used it for so long, you need at least this much time outside of it 
uncompressing. I, Talita's talked about rest, and I agree. I always think of resting, limits, self-care practices. I am a professional when I do my job. Am I a professional when I am resting? Do I give myself a good time to rest? Do I allow myself to have pleasure, joy, or am I always connected to something tense? This is something I listen to a lot. People are addicted to adrenaline, addicted to anxiety. How can we uh, turn ourselves off? Even for that, we need practice. It's not easy to just say, take a day off. It, it, it's like you're talking to someone and he's really angry at you and you say, relax, take a chill pill. That person doesn't want that. How can you help in this process? How can you facilitate that? These are three interesting things for us to think about. Limits, rest, and self-care practices. And to do this with support collectively makes it easier. It's really hard when I have individual patterns which are deeply rooted and change that. And people are looking at, at us now or reading a text, watching a video. Alone, it's not enough. And the last thing I wanted to say uh, uh, that was in the chat comment, the link to download the basic guide of uh, mental uh, health for journalists. Uh, I was uh, I was happy enough to write it. And there's a list of places that provide psychological support, free or low cost, throughout Brazil. So we have a lot of resources, practices, a guide, and there's a huge list at the end that can be very, very rich. So feel free to download and share it freely. That's what I wanted to say about this. Chico. Thank you. And I'd like to, to actually uh, share bad news, sad news today, because Don Phillips said that, and also, I mean, they they actually were found dead, so their death has been confirmed, unfortunately. So, since uh, we have these problems all the time, you know, with journalists, they usually cover our business and, and, and all that uh, serious and, and, and heavy subject. You guys, you, Talita, as a journalist, how can you deal with that? How the associations, how the agencies should deal with this type of situation? Talita, would you like to start? Yes, maybe. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Shiku, it's very pertinent to bring this subject. It's scary. It's uh, da so dangerous, you know, this type of things. I mean, we know the violence against the journalists is so big. And, and, it, and it really depends to what, what region you work, or you live, and if the the media gives you more visibility or not, you know how much of uh, exp exposure you have as a journalist and people that have a lot of visibility. I mean, we, we don't know the details about their uh, murders, but this really calls attention. It shows where we're heading and how we deal with this as an individual, as a journalist, as a country, as a company that makes journalism. In fact, we, we really need to create more than ever a safety protocol because we have to be aware that sending journalists to cover some sorts of uh, subjects, they need to go ready they need to have support they need to be protected they need to be safe to work and this is no it's not new 
so many times journalists go as freelancers or they go uh, to cover some uh, some subjects sometimes they don't even have drivers waiting for them at a safe way you know what i mean we're, we're speaking about the amazon of course you know and it's hard there are rivers there are lakes there are animals there are uh, it's a jungle so we should stop and reflect because unfortunately we just had this tragedy and it's un unacceptable to see where we are heading how can we protect our professionals how do companies protect themselves and their uh, reporters we have to stop and think i mean uh Brenda spoke about uh, anxiety and adrenaline. Of course, we are composed by uh, young reporters, young people that are young in their prof in age and in their professions, in their careers. So the individual needs to stop and think and not accept all you know the passions that they are usually um, subjected to. We see in cases like the conflict in Ukraine, what happened to so many reporters. We see what's happening every day in, in um, the Amazon and see what happened with uh, Dawn. And uh, I mean, they, they traveled to the Amazon. They were there to, to work, to cover things. And many times reporters that are not uh, particularly from that region, they don't know that dangerous place they don't know the dangers what kind of equipment what kind of infrastructure they need you know protocols is there any satellite uh, phone there are areas in the amazon uh, remote places that they don't have internet access they don't have a phone line you know what i mean so imagine that we're speaking about serious stuff here and companies need to really understand this new reality. We know that the reporters are there, but we shouldn't let them, let them alone. We have to be careful as we do our job. Maybe we should maybe, I don't know, write less articles and, and, and really dedicate ourselves in doing something more in a, in a safer way we have to adapt to the new realities because we're suffering attacks in social media, physical attacks, physical threatenings. This is so evident. We just had this tragedy happening to Don and to the, uh, the Brazilian uh, together with him. I mean, this is crazy. We have to create, again, say, protocols and rethink. I am not trying to not motivate us to cover some and such uh, subjects but we need to be safe to do something with good quality we need plenty we need uh to spend money we need to uh working with with a better inf infrastructure we have to tell the stories as we have to tell the stories but these stories must be told in a say we have to think about the people the uh, professionals that are exposed to this dangerous it's a sad day to all of us. But Guilherme, I just want to go back to what uh, you said about the attacks that happen. They are perceived in different ways depending on the individual realities of the reporters. Of course, it depends on uh, gender, uh, gender uh, social situation, uh, cultural, communities, LGBTQ, uh, I plus. We have to respect the individualities, but at the same time, we must create an answer that pretty much serves to everybody because the reporters need to be, uh, if they are victims of attacks in an unproportional way, depending on the status that he or she has within his company, you know, sometimes they have, like Lemmy said, secondary traumas. Maybe she or he was not attacked, but by working at such company, you know, they feel attacked and exposed too. And another something, another thing that I'd like to say is that we have to be more cooperative. We have to really uh, be more 
like better colleagues, better co-workers. If your co-worker suffered something, you have not to be afraid to report what happened. So Shiku, I think pretty much this is it. Well, uh, besides all of uh, Talita said, I think this should be a very proper moment to think in how we're going to deal with mourning, you know, or, or unhope, loneliness, that people that are freelancers, how it's going to be, or people that live far from where they work, right now right now just right after this tragedy should we open some conversations should we invite professionals that help that can help the uh the uh, media offices you know where people work there because everybody is so emotionally touched a situation a sad situation like this one i guess it opens the opportunity for us to have that what would be if we were able to, to, to dream of a ideal place to work, I mean, an ideal uh, newspaper or media office or something, you know, in different occasions, that office, a group of journalists that actually understand that mental health compassion and so are key factors in order to deal with a tragedy like this this is very sad you know about the these two people deaths uh in the last course that i ministered there were two thousand journalists registered almost two thousand journalists but two thousand people register to that course and when we speak about deaths and tragedies and everything that's happening in brazil right now it's almost impossible for us not to bring social markers as key there was a class focused on race lucas and jay's assis both um, psychologists they approached that subject and i think the i think experiencing pain death mourning it's part of what we live as journalists but more intensively you know it has to do with the social markers the social indicators and i don't think it's out of the scope of a media office to have a conversation like this a debate like this with our team because we we should be able to dream of a journalism that's ideal we have to have conversations like this one in order to really see and experience all of the the all the tribulations and all the bad aspects of being a journalist how dangerous that is it's even cruel to tell the person okay you need psychological help you need professional i mean how come if i'm working with something that can bring take me to exhaustion and then the person needs to deal with that alone needs to what operate a miracle i don't agree with that you know this is a structural debate this is not individual because of course it has to do with others. Of course, individually, the journalists need to really ask themselves, I mean, this tragedy, what, what do I need to elaborate this, to understand, do I need some time off? Do I need to be alone a little bit? Do I need a break? I mean, do I need to, to work with my therapist? Do I need to look for a therapist and so on? How am I going to be able to deal with this? Because this is bad news and other sad news, unfortunately, believe me, will happen throughout this year, this elections uh, year. 
So collectively, not only individually, we should deal with this morning feeling that comes up uh, because of this really, really bad tragedy that we just had. About the culture of silence. Um, I'd like to speak about gender. Let's talk about sexism, many aspects of sexism. Uh, we kind of know that media offices, especially you know, the news, newspaper offices and so on, there's a lot of sexism going on. They don't talk about mental health because huh, that's a little bit kind of, eh, you know, they're too sexist even to deal with mental health. They're too like macho man to even agree that they can have, you know, emotional or mental uh, uh, problems. How can you, Talita, would you like to, to speak or should I go ahead? No, you can go ahead, you can go ahead. Shiko. It's interesting because I work with this uh, subject for 15 years. I found it years ago, something called, uh, called kind of like guys uh, chat or something like that. You know, in our last study, we heard 20,000 women and 20,000 men, seven out of 10 men. They do not, they, they, they really say that they do not talk about, they do not talk about deep feelings with their friends they, they say that they feel lonely but they don't really um, say that high levels of anxiety depression solitude do not talk about their personal uh, problems and that they learn ever since they are little kids they learn not to talk about their emotions because these were feminine characteristics and me myself as a boy as a man as a male so supposedly i shouldn't speak about that supposedly i'm a heterosexual that do not express your emotions do not express your sensitivity because that shows weakness if you are powerful and if you are sure, don't do that. Don't express that. And that kind of makes uh, them, you know, not to value emotional difficulties, difficulties that others have, unless it's too, too severe. So they tend to reduce that, even though internally, deep in my heart, I, I, I feel that serious and sad, but me, myself, as a leader, I should manifest, I should say what's important. I am empathic, but I don't spend too much time or even money. If you don't have money, who don't even mind about spending time, you know, to that subject. And I don't motivate meetings as a leader. I myself as a leader don't go to therapy, don't do don't look for psychological help and that you see to me so what i'm saying is that what they what i we found out in that uh survey journalism uh to me is i mean masculinity inclusion diversity sexism is a wound brazil is a latin country very, uh, it happens this a lot. I mean, this is sexism is very dense in Brazil, but certainly in my personal experience as a journalist, these areas are made by people in the society. There's a, a reflection. We are what the society is. It's common in the circles we live in. It wouldn't be any different in journalism. But what I see is a difficulty. The fact that there's not enough opening for women to talk about this. We know there are cases of harassment by sources, by bosses. This is not something we work with. I don't want to talk about A, B. There's a culture that needs to be changed and things need to be talked about. It, 
people need to be punished. The debate must happen. We need space for men uh, not to manifest themselves sensitive, vulnerable, and what Guilherme was saying about men don't want to look feminine because feminine is considered weak, therefore inferior. So many times, many of the leading uh, job positions, in, in some new rooms there's more women than men, but majoritarily, the leading roles, talking broadly about this, I'm not going to talk about exceptions. The exception is not the rule. Of course, there are exceptions. But most, uh, in most cases, the ones on top are men. And the fact that there's only a few women uh, in ma the main jobs of new rooms makes the few women that rise adopt a... They act in a male way because if there's a sensibility, they're going to be criticized. They're going to say she's not uh, strong enough, things that we hear. So many times, many new newsrooms have bosses who are men, and in a few places where women are leading, the women themselves demonstrate not having empathy with gender issues of other women who are under them. I don't want to criticize uh, women in the in leading roles. I just want to think about how the structure is so deeply rooted that the women themselves end up assimilating these values of for men that you have to be strong. You cannot show vulnerability with the more male features because there's fear of being disqualified and I, I see there's no structure in the work environment. I'm not talking about uh, race or gender because it, it, we are still very white in these environments because of uh, how people are hired, the access people have to university. I don't have to tell you what's obvious regarding inequality in our society, of course. The newsrooms replicate that, and what we need, what I miss in newsroom environments, and I talk about my co-workers, is to have a place of opening, actual opening. The, the, you know, we're always really busy, difficult to sit down and talk, but we must, especially in a moment of crisis like we're living in, of attacks from all sides, threats, more than ever, they have to stop and think about the processes, the procedures, the protocols, practices. We must listen to each other. The bosses need to hear the reporters. They are uh, demanding from authorities uh, clarification. This is our job. And people have the right to demand their bosses. That there was a freelancer who was afraid of being stigmatized and she decided not to work with uh, something because of the impact. And there's this fear and I see this. I talk as a woman. Lots of times a woman wants to work more just to run away from the stigma. Well, a woman's going to say, you're not going to do this because they're a woman or, or because of uh, motherhood. Lots of times women uh, who end up becoming moms or during pregnancy they work more to prove that they can do it i can handle it all of this happens in an environment of uh, salary uh, uh, differences there's lack of transparency as far as policies in news uh, papers the places that are talking about race discrepancies uh, wages discrepancies this contributes to mental health in many different ways in, in this aspect of mental health, there's a big stigma and it, it, it doesn't affect in an equal way people depending on their social markers, their gender, racial markers. There must exist talk. We must talk. There must be room for people to speak out and to be heard and practices must be modified.
And I think it's really sad to see good articles done by good people on gender. This practice is really far from what it should be at. And women are not uh, encouraged to talk about this. They mock women. Ah, they complain a lot. They think they're always against it. They, they place themselves as victims. People must be heard. Women must be heard. That's my contribution. Thank you, Talita. Lots of times we talk about the mental health of journalists. The journalist also has a family. And sometimes it's hard to deal with family and friends, people close to you, with the routine of attacks, threats, but other things like workloads of 14, 16 hours, people who work with sports, they travel in the middle of the night, they spend three days out and come back, uh, being on duty on weekends, long hours. How do you deal with the mental health of the family? How do you do, how do you protect the people you love from the profession you chose. I am going to comment. This kind of report, I've, I've heard a lot and over the years. The first thing that can be interesting to share is how beneficial it is to have a collective sharing regarding this. It could be virtual or physical round the first course I gave to journalists on this theme, I had lots of content, researchers, figures, slides. I couldn't even do 20% of what I had planned because people wanted to talk. They wanted to be heard. They wanted to share experiences. So I think this could be a good start. As we share experiences, there's more empathy in the team. And an editor maybe was not realizing that he, she was being invasive, generating consequences. Or people in the team with the what they're doing, sending WhatsApp messages anytime during the day, at night, you know, demanding things at any time. So this could be a very interesting process. In my case, I don't have any kids. I I am divorced, recently divorced, so my greatest care now is with myself when I was in a relationship. This generated an impact on my partner, and a big impact, and I think for the person to be able to talk about this in therapy or any other context, that's really important for you not to have a emotional bad breath spitting your internal confusions on others. I consider key to have at least one uh, regular self-care practice, meditation, yoga, uh, an exercise that is good for you. What practice that makes you be in touch with your emotional world that nourishes you. Otherwise, there's no way we, we, we can uh, overcome a lot of our difficulties during the day and it, it can be passed on to the ones surrounding us. So this is really important. It could be interesting. Even the little guide I put on the YouTube chat, sharing material like that with the family could be interesting for the family to understand a bit more what the journalists are going through. And we put anonymous reports, uh, we show the panorama. Lots of times there's an historic effort from journalists trying to uh, separate their families from what's happening, but they become a pressure pen. They're exhausted, really. Uh, I, I notice as well, there's a delicate point regarding uh, fatherhood, motherhood. You mentioned 
the sports uh, reporter who's always traveling. Let's say he's a father. He's living a responsible uh, fatherhood, active one. Is he able to have a dialogue at the work environment for his daily routine to transform for him to be able to actively become a more present father? Is there space for him to share this thing in the work environment? Is there an awareness to the impact there is to, to be a journalist with a small kid? It's very challenging. In, in the workshops I've done throughout the pandemic, the fathers and mothers at home were going crazy. If you have a, a work environment led by someone who doesn't have kids or who's not a primary caretaker who has a nanny there could be an alienation on on this issue that person created a structure that somehow can lower this impact so these are a few considerations i am curious to hear talita talk about this i don't have any kids either but I decided to adopt a pet, cat, because they could spend more time at home alone, something that a dog couldn't do. But uh, jokes aside, I heard something that reminds me, the Brasilia routine over the last few times. I've worked as a reporter in Sao Paulo, Brasilia, my family life. I can work with in different ways. I remember listening from a boss when we were talking about hiring a new co-worker for a spot that was open. I suggested one name and he said, he's really good, but he's too worried about his family. And that shocked me. It wasn't the only comment I heard in Brasilia and really worried about his family. He just wanted to have working hours that they were normal, knowing when he was going to be on duty, uh, time to get in, time to get off. And uh, lots of times things are misunderstood in our activity. There's a questioning all the time on how professional and how dedicated you are, depending on how many hours you make available to the website, to the newspaper, for TV, whatever you are working at. And this is harmful. It's bad for everyone. It's bad for your boss. I've seen bosses in situations. I noticed that they weren't well. But how would I come to, you know, that guy and say, I don't think you're well, you know, go on vacation because precisely because there is culture that needs to be changed. The pandemic brought new challenges, uh, salaries, have been cut, uh, hours have been cut, and how can you work less? It was a challenge. And to have a controlled work uh, schedule, as Guilherme said, you have self-care journeys. I like to swim, but I like to swim because I cannot see my phone when I'm swimming. And I left the swimming pool really scared that people could have called me. Maybe there was an emergency and I was swimming like I was doing something I should, but you know, it doesn't matter. This difficulty of having established agenda with you know, a time you start working, a time you stop working, uh, how people are assessed all the time uh, through this, the phone, that makes it really difficult to, you know, be careful with your family. I see people with difficulty on how to uh, pay attention to your children or your wife or husband. Let's say you're having dinner, being present, family gatherings and not being on a cell phone, talking to a source or to the newsroom. Uh, or this is a really complicated issue and it has, uh, I'm going to be insistent here and it's really different uh, between men and women, uh, starting from uh, motherhood and fatherhood uh, leaves, uh, even if a couple, I'm talking of a man-woman couple here, but well, if they decide to have a more uh, equal sharing of activities regarding kids, men and women 
have different leaves from work based on legal aspects. It goes beyond the company. But uh, some companies can go beyond from you know, a few days to a few more days on uh, these work leaves from four to six months or the journalist can uh, you know, get days off together with vacation time. So it's really hard to uh, work you know, your family life with the work life and there's no incompatibility in the work itself, but the work model to which we have adapted to be in. And I think this has an impact on the lives of family members, whatever setting you have at home. Even if you don't have kids, wife, husband, father, mother, friends, it's really hard for people to have a social life. And that has an impact on their well-being. People need time for leisure. You are an individual before you are a journalist. And for you to be uh, outside of your journalistic self and be in different spheres of the society, you already uh, set your side apart from many things. You have to be uh, unbiased. You cannot see. You cannot let people see your opinions because you, they're going to judge you. It's an idealistic thing. People are formed by a context. You have come from a place. You have an opinion. It's impossible for you to be exempt of any opinion. It's, a, it's something that's praiseable for people to be absent from their uh, beliefs. And, but uh, this melting of the individual, of the persona he, he represents as a reporter brings great impact and the non-separation of this, the working hours, the, the, the time to rest, the time for therapy. You know, I, I've heard people complaining they were interrupted during therapy. The boss was like, uh, uh, the boss was asking, where are you? And they were like, well, I didn't answer because I was in therapy. And so it's, it, there's a problem with that. And it has an impact in the challenge. How to negotiate that with the family. It's okay for people to understand that there's, you know, duty on Christmas, New Year's, Carnival, but it does not stop people from having a family life. One thing is to be on duty on weekends. Another thing is never knowing when you're going to work. You're going to work every weekend, every holiday, to have your vacation canceled. Everything is urgent. Everything is a problem. There's no priority. If there's no priority, the work is not good. A communication vehicle cannot deliver good work if they don't know how to prioritize things. Our resources are limited. We have human resources, which are limited, limited times, limited space, financial resources. We must prioritize, especially now in this moment of crisis. This is essential. So I say this for many things. We must change this culture. We try to produce journalism in the way we, we worked a long time ago without the internet, with more team, with no social media, with all, without all these attacks that we are suffering now. So this must be rethought and people must negotiate with their bosses and impose more. I need family life. You have to understand more. The bosses need family life as well. I've seen colleagues who are bosses saying that their kids, their, their, their school activities, they were laughing. But I think it's sad that the kid wrote, my mother lives at the newspaper. This is not healthy. It's clearly not healthy. I think these are my main contributions. Thank you. We are moving towards the end. If you want to make your final comment, Alita, you can start. Yes, of course. One thing I remembered regarding family issues, I remember the book 
Máquina do Ódio, written by Patricia Mello, great reporter and friend of William São Paulo. She starts her book saying that her son says, Mom, they're talking about you. They were saying bad things about her simply because she was doing great work. And there's a campaign to deconstruct journalism to diminish the work being done by journalists. Just to conclude that before I go into my final comment, how this discussion within the companies on mental health must think of children, how they're affected family members, uh, the partners, moms, the uh, fathers. This must be extended and understood. On final contributions, on the one hand, I worry about what's going to happen this year. I think we are seeing a very tough scenario regarding, unfortunately, the confirmation of the death of Bruno and Don, what happened in the Amazon. This is an extremely severe moment. This is not acceptable. We must demand from authorities that this case is investigated. We must demand a conduct from authorities which condemns what's happening. This is not acceptable. As journalists, as society, company, individuals, we cannot accept this kind of thing to happen. This is really severe. On the practices, I go back to what I was saying before. I agree with Guilherme when he talks about a change of culture. The culture must change. I've said that many times. The culture must be reviewed. What it means, uh, journalist commitment, and what is the right of the reporter to have the right to rest, encourage reporter to be okay when he's resting. That must happen. We cannot individualize that one person is going to decide by himself, I'm going to rest now, I'm going to meditate, meditate 20 minutes a day, I'm going to run 10 kilometers a day. You have to change the culture. Alone, people are not going to be able to change. Inside the companies, this must be modified. Of course, you need individual action, but you need a responsabilization and a care by the entire company. You need reporters to uh, support themselves in different coverages when they're attacked directly, indirectly. This is really important. There must be support from legal aspects. There must be protocols. Reporters must go to the field to cover things, feeling supported, protected in many ways. They must know that they're going to be supported by the company, by the their bosses in an institutional way if he's attacked. He's not going to be afraid of being criticized in the company, which is a reality that still happens today based on what I talk about with my colleagues. And I have seen this. We need to have legal support if something happens. People need to be punished. It's not acceptable for attacks to be done against journalists and companies do not to do Anything about it, uh, legally speaking, reporters are being attacked on behalf of the company. The criticism is targeting the name of the reporter, but the person is being attacked because the person represents a company, not just what he's doing as an individual. So you need legal support and the companies need to take measures. We need protocols on how to protect to ask if people are feeling safe, a place to welcome people, for, for companies to see the visual issues that led people to be attacked, not uh, a, a, an attack or they having to justify why he was attacked because of a certain question. So we have to think of social markers and at the same time, there must be equivalency. Everybody needs to be protected in a uh, uh, work environment, whatever job position he has. It doesn't matter if it's someone who's just starting, if it's a special experience reporter, people must be protected in equal ways. And conversations shouldn't just happen with victims. I think it's really pertinent when the Guilherme talks about the secondary trauma 
there's a trauma and a fear of those who are in the front line or not. People are exposed to this violent environment, an aggressive environment, whether they are in the Amazon you know, covering uh, mining or in Brasilia on the streets or in newsrooms. People, of course, the attacks are different, but there must be broad care regarding this. Another thing I strengthen here is the need for rest and protection as far as technology. A framework that people use protected against hacking their social media, their, their, their private media, their personal data. There are many things that must be taken care of. This is a concern for everybody. Companies must do something about this. This is serious. It's really severe. What we are seeing today is really severe and unacceptable. A journalist was killed and a state agent even though Bruno Pereira was uh, not working for FUNAI, he is an employee of the state. And it's really severe to see this happening in our country when people are looking at the Amazon, the environmental climate, uh, forest protection issue is really strong. We cannot let this happen, whether it's the coverage of Amazonia or whatever. We have to change the paradigm of culture. We are not covering elections in the previous context. We have a new scenario, much more aggressive, whether it is on the streets, social media, and nothing is worth to cover if the reporters are being exposed. Things need to be covered, but with safe protocols, we have to reinforce the physical, mental, and the integrity of all. The companies have, when we are discussing fake news, the, the stronger the companies are, the journalism institution must be strengthened. We must not just think of the reporter. Everybody wins. The company wins with it be placed to this serious, ethical, committed journalism, seeking the truth and protecting its professionals. The reporters are going to be to going to work on the field in a safer and more efficient way, doing their work, which is to bring the news. They cannot be afraid for their safety. The journalist must feel safe at all times. Thank you. I think these were my contributions. I think I have talked too much. A lot of applause. Great. Chico, I fully agree with Talita. When I think of the newsrooms, I think of the pillars. How can we change culture with mental health in the center? What kind of protocol we need to think of to structure? Making it really clear there are many different protocols that do not involve money. They involve attention, empathy, reviewing processes, but not necessarily more money. And training. What trainings are going to take place? Speeches, workshops, how can I support platforms? Knight Center has provided this kind of support. At a Google News Initiative, they're providing the support. Centers that provide psychological support free of charge or, or really cheap. So we have to translate these pillars into practical actions. If I don't know how to work with culture, if you are a leader of a team, going to therapy and talking about this is already good. Connecting with your yoga, leaving early or because you have to take your kids to an activity, valuing your individuality, your family, your self-care, your emotional world communicates a lot already. As far as protocols, we can think we are going to establish a protocol if uh, someone raises a hand and says, I need to rest, I need support, or I don't want to handle this, I cannot handle this, this is not a problem. The team is going to deal with that. They're going to be literate regarding trauma, secondary trauma, uh, burnout, just understanding the definitions and the most common symptoms 
that makes it easier for me to navigate. Another thing that may encourage the appearance of protocols, let's say the uh, Harvey, that tragedy, one of the, the terrible uh, hurricanes, there was uh, a study on the impact on journalists. If I remember well, 20% of the journalists had uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and something close to 40% of them had depression. And there's a public study with uh, this uh, research that invites us to, to look at it. If there is someone who was allocated for especially difficult coverage, what do they need now that they're out of it? More rest, lighter coverage. Are we going to talk to these people and understand how we are going to uh, work with this post hard coverage issue? How are we going to create teams that are going to take turns? Now you are in a radioactive coverage, but then you're going to leave there and go into something else. And I will do this kind of coverage. Maybe, uh, um, you know, just a few ideas for us to think collectively. And at the individual level, we have to think of limits. What limits I want, I may need to establish for myself, for my family, to protect and care the people I love. Do I have established limits today or the situation is complicated, but I have never negotiated established clear limits? How do I deal with my rest? Whether it's uh, sleeping quality, the leisure uh, uh, things, or do I don't even offer myself the opportunity to rest and, and self-care practices? This is key. Otherwise, we're not going to have the chance. If during the day, during the week, we cultivate 8, 10, 12 hours a day, a mind that is more agitated, tense, anxious, reactive, if I don't have minimally space to have a different kind of mind, I'm going to carry over this tense mind to all other activities I engage in. So I go on vacation, but it doesn't seem like I'm on vacation. Wherever I am, I cannot rest. I cannot relax. So I think it's important for us to cultivate that. Uh, I don't want to be repetitive. We have said this uh, many uh, different times. Guilherme, Karina, lots of people uh, have worked to create this guide, download it, share it, help spread this conversation. I think something we can do is to break the silence, to uh, stop this culture of silence and do actual changes, actions inside or outside the newsrooms. I thank you so much for having participated here. Thank you, Chico. Thank you, Talita. Thank you, Luis from Lupa, who organized this event. We are the ones who thank you, Guilherme, uh, Talita. I am now going to give the floor to Luis and Marcela. Here, Marcella, we're back. What a great conversation. What a beautiful debate. I even told Guilherme, and I said, I really want to be part of the debate, creating solutions, creating answers, answers. and I am sure that we have to do uh, more and more things even for tomorrow. It's so important for us to debate mental health for journalists, especially in a year like this one. We know that the attacks will increase. Talita said that women are often more attacked. We speak about physical attacks, talk about those attacks that happen um, right there near the, the president um, office, whatever. We know how women are attacked physically, personally, 
through the uh, social media. And still speaking about this panel, Chico Arias brought a question, which was an excellent one. And Chico said that Don Phillips and Bruno Pereira's uh, bodies were identified. What we have of information, we just uh, read an article published by G1 site. This information about the bodies being located was not yet confirmed by the federal police. And we are really praying for this not to be a uh, dam, you know, so we don't know 100% sure about them uh, being really, really about th those bodies being their bodies. I'd like to invite you to take a break. We are coming back in three minutes just for us to really, you know, get some more coffee, drink some water. The Misinfocom Brazil program will continue. We're going to have the academic immersion. Three researchers will bring their cooperations here, but, you know, they're bringing their um, thesis here, and we're going to approach the theme in other sectors, in other formats. So we are really fighting against misinformation. Go get some water, go get some coffee, and we're coming back in about three minutes.
Você conseguiu pegar... So, were you able to get some coffee? Actually, we're going to have a late lunch today. Miss Infocom Brazil is the first edition in Brazil, and it's together with Lupa Agents and Hacks to Hackers and the debate about media education and journalism is so important. We have to have democratic and critical information. We have to be able to do that. We need to take this to different uh, segments. We need to really make people able in, uh, to fight against misinformation. People should be able to know if an information is true or fake. I'd like to invite you for the academic immersion. We're bringing three researchers that are actually taking this subject to elementary school, high school, and uh, so on, because we need to really create this conversation that actually break barriers in order for us not have misinformation in the future. Fact checking is great because we really want not to work with this anymore. You know, it would be great when we get to that day in which we're not going to have uh, fake information. Well, Rafael. Kappa today is not going to be here with us, but we have having Vitor Terra replacing Rafael Kappa today. Vitor is going to be, uh, you know, he's going to be leading this uh, table. And Vitor, the floor is yours. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Luis. Thank you to all the guests, all the attendees. We're going to start the Missing Falcon Brazil uh, debate, the immersion. Thanks for Hego, Carlos, and Lydia. Thank you for, so much for being here with us. We're going to debate this very interesting and uh, important themes. This debate is, of course, going to be an academic immersion, but Let's make this as kind of like a cross-disciplinary theme. Professor Regina is a journalist and she is a doctor in communication processes by the University of Paulista de São Paulo. She's also a part of the Barcelona University and she is the ex-president of the scientific debate. Sosicon, Professor Regina, she is a professor and she's part of the University of Piauí. She's a coordinator of the fight against misinformation. We're very, very happy to have Professor Regina here. She's talking, she's going to talk about her uh, research about surveillance and control of attention. Welcome, Professor Regina. Kyle Mita, she's uh, from the, he's an, if he works for the University Federal of Bahia. Also, he works for the, this um, entity in the United States in order to strengthen the journalism. Kyle is going to speak about the dimension of technology and how the technology, the tech cons can collaborate, can cooperate on this in order to fact, to check the facts. And we also have Lilian Tropiano. She is a researcher. She comes from a family of teachers and professors. She he has uh, skills in literature and the Portuguese language. The University Federal of Fluminense in Rio de Janeiro. She works there. She works with communication and education in the University of Lisboa. Lydia works for the city uh, school. She works in Nova Iguaçu, Rio de Janeiro. She works with culture 
and she looks for theories for educational interventions that really can create and insert media literacy in the, in the education uh, process for them to uh, really have to ex act in their citizenship, you know, the children. So I'd like to start with Professor Anna Regina. We're going to speak about all this service and everything, you know, it's important to mention that Lupa Agency is very concerned about the scientific productions, so science, academia, and for us, you know, sharing this information, it's really key to say that uh, media education within the classrooms is actually uh, making us to lead with this phenomenon in a better way it's easier for us now to identify fake news and so on. So, Professor Ana Regina, the floor is yours. Well, good morning, good afternoon to all of you. It's nice. Caio and Miriam. Miriam, she's a partner of ours too. It's good. I know we're going to have good interventions here. We're going to have a good collaboration. And it's a nice to, to have this opportunity and show what we're living nowadays. Misinformation is our strategy. My thesis here, my article is on this, where the misinformation is more disseminated with this digital life that everybody is uh, having now, you know, we are deeply inserted in that we do this every day, 24 seven, and what are the implications that this has have in our days, how we can, and how the dissemination of a misinformation is uh, growing. So the surveillance and control for misinformation we started with a plenary uh, society bringing the symbology of the Bethan uh, channel as an image of a, a, a structure of a system. Kind of like having a disciplinary society from where, where you have people that have been um, observed and that also are observing. So the people that are under surveillance, they are being observed, but also are extracting data from others in order to really keep that, that, that their discipline, especially in spaces uh, where they are inserted maybe in sanatories or in prisons, jail, and so on. And then when we talk about the control of uh, fake news, it is a, a society that is controlling and observing, everybody judges and is judged. And this reflects the process that Shokshana Zubov calls uh, capitalism of surveillance. How can we translate this? We are deep dove in a digital life in which we are surveillers and, and surveilled. We produce content and as we produce content, we dispute the attention with all of those that produce content within the global digital media or platforms, social medias, uh, apps, you know, we, because we're always producing content or disputing attention and there's a big dissemination of, of, of information. So our attention at the same time, it's, it's sold. So we buy attention 
we sell attention, we are disputing attention with the others, the platforms sell our attention too, and there is another process that structures all this, this um, nets, working with attention strategies with users. Users are all of us, you know, the consumer is a target of the platforms. So the user keeps more and more connected within this digital uh, village. And it's very different than the traditional media because the traditional media keeps a centrality. But the digital platforms, though, they are uh, happening all the time. So we are experimenting this new status. And in, within this new process, we are available, you know, theoretically, we are super free, but we're not super free because the behavioral psychology is very eff effective, keeping things attractive because they are also attracting attention and then the attention is there for them to have data uh, mining you know our uh, id number our name address where we work where we live this is commercialized all the time so effectively what's mined from us what's uh, digged from us is the human experience. This immense space for human uh, experience where the past and the present are correlating, that's the core business of the platforms. What is sold by the platforms all the time, each second, is our experience as a consumer. They call it, you know, it's like the predi prediction of a capital. How is Regina behaving in a second or in the near future about theology, about ideologies, religion, politics, and then how is she going to behave about a tangible, intangible products? Everything composed this capital, and that's the reserve. That's what saved in these uh, platforms, you know, in their safes. So this is what we are. We are what's being commercialized, what's being sold, and we put ourselves within this universe, this environment. We are producing content, we're fighting to have everybody's attention, we're disputing the attention, we want to be there, we want to reach, we want our information produced by us, to be disseminated. So this information is everywhere in this case because the platforms usually say that misinformation is not uh, a strategy that is desired by this. They really love to say that because they do that because of the society's uh, legislation or behaviors or the attempt and the platform, the platform say, no, we don't work with misinformation. We work with business models. But the strategies that are put technologically and the algorithms and so on, they favor that those statements potentially. And they really work with this information because the morphologic uh, composition of the statements you know, they work with uh, aesthetics, they work with content that really approach the true uh, regimen with values and beliefs and things that will uh, maybe, I don't know, hurt society, hurt kids and so on. So 70% of the power of the misinformation, uh, I mean, misinformation is 70% more powerful than information. And this is intentionally or no intentionally, this business model of the platforms end up favoring the misinformation market and the misinformation market is intentional. We know, and it's growing. They work hard 
and they do it for money. They make a lot of profit because it attracts more investments. And not all the time the investments or the investors know where their logos and their brands and their money, their investment is going. They don't know where it goes. So, and then to cut this um, input of money for channels that work with uh, hate speech or Nazi contents, conspiracy uh, theories and so on. So it's, it's, a, it's very complex yet, but the platforms do uh, benefit that. They even, even the hate speech and by the way they are produced and then the looks that they use, the layouts, the aesthetics, the statements, these are not of, uh, pure fake news or pure frauds or pure lies like the, the gay kids or stuff like that. We receive a world of information that comes with a fact. So there is a fact, but then right after that, there is something completely fraudulent and then there is something completely out of context, you know, uh, on purpose, making things hard even impossible if it's hard for even journalists to fact uh, to check facts is imagine uh normal people that are not journalists so my uh, research is really on that how we can really uh break those strategies uh because it, this kind of represents a new type of colonialism in order to be you know the main uh, capital, information is the main capital then. And then, so maybe we could really uh, make things uh, clearer to the listeners, to the readers of, of the medias and just to understand what's really going on, not only in our country, Brazil, but in others. So basically, I don't know if I made myself clear, but pretty much that's a summary of what I uh, did and uh, my text, my article is available and you, can, you guys can go ahead and, and check there. Uh, it's available and I believe the reading is easy and it's interesting. Thank you, Rafael. Thank you to all of you for inviting me. It's important to say that Lupa is starting today an important project called Ashada. We're going to contemplate all the works being presented here, there. It's important to present to the public how we are thinking of fighting misinformation from the scientific bias, bringing together works and scientific productions in a place with criteria, with curatorship, with experts on education, the public will be able to have access to it for free and use this material and the work today here will be allocated in our repository. Um, the, we have a partner here at Lupa regarding WhatsApp. Now, with the floor, Kai Almeida, for him to talk about his research, thinking of technology. Kai, with you. Thank you, Vitor. Really nice to have this discussion from a multidisciplinary standpoint. Very good uh, explanation from Professor Anna. This is a serious problem of our current days. I come here to bring a bit of the work we have developed at MIDA. And we developed in the academia, developing technologies that can optimize this process. It's a hard work for the long term in a small scale so far. 
uh, much smaller in scale than the misinformation content is produced. It's an education program and we believe it's the solution in the long run. We cannot wait for all the work to be done and the problem keeps on affecting the actual lives of people with the results of elections and equally severe issues. We believe technology can be a great ally to streamline this checking, fact checking process in scale. And we bring a little bit of this work. One of the ways we think of doing this optimization is analyzing text similarity. That's what I am going to show you. Uh, it'll take five to 10 minutes and then we'll discuss more. The automatic identification of fake content is not a trivial task. It's really complex. I want to bring here, there's this idea that technology can be a solution just or for the problem that it can solve the problem in a complete way, and that is not true. There are many works that try to identify in an automatic way and finding, trying to find algorithmic solutions to find fake content, but the accuracy is not very high. The best works in this area usually go to about 70% accuracy, sometimes 80% when we see a specific set of data, but that's not enough when you want to use this as a measure for that. So there are works of, uh, for contents that are spread on the internet and it analyzes links of inlets, outlets, uh, comments, things that uh, create comments generated by robot, <laughs> animated clear that there's a market behind this content which is created and shared, spread. Much of this content comes from the sharing of uh, advertising of informational material you can analyze these links and technological infrastructure to identify if the content can be fake. But still, this is a risky approach to be done fully automated. We are proposing a, an approach with human intervention. Technology uh, needs to help to streamline this process, but the final decision depends on human intervention. This solution is one of the many tools we are uh, using. I saw a code in this flow. This is the check checking flow. The this is a free software. The meter is developing since 2012 to fight misinformation used by partners worldwide. In Brazil, Lupa is one of the partners to check WhatsApp information. We've been partners since 2011, and it's been used in electoral process in the United States in 2016, France 2017, Mexico 2018, India 2019. It was the first time we started working with uh, fake content analysis in WhatsApp, the greatest market of WhatsApp in India, the greatest... Uh, Democratic collection of the world, and since 2020, we've been working with partners in Brazil and worldwide, checking misinformation in the context of the pandemic, the COVID pandemic. One of the tools we supply in the software is this uh, text similarity analysis, so that similar uh, content is grouped together and the checking is optimized. Imagine that 10,000 people can report uh, to these bots the same content to be checked, and it's not necessary to do human analysis of 10,000 pieces of content. The tool comes 
with this uh, possibility to check content that have been grouped and considered similar. When it's really high, there's no need for human intervention. We're talking about 95% here. Anything less than that, we demand human intervention, even if it is to confirm. The proposal is to use this analysis of tax similarity. There is no universal tool that does tax similarity to any language. We try to have groups of texts, specifics for each language. We train the algorithm to analyze text similarity for that specific language. And as of then, the algorithm starts to identify if the content is similar to another one that has been previously checked. We have this content base that has been checked already by the agency or partners. And when new content arrives to be checked, it is compared with everything that has been checked previously as true or false. And once it's considered similar, the same consideration, the, the same uh, analysis will be made, either true or false to it. So the, the, the algorithm never says a text is true or false. It's always based on the, what has been considered before uh, comparing the material. Since we are here, I'm not going to go into mathematical details here, but just to, to avoid the idea of uh, making this look like magic, the solution is what we call vectorial machine learning uh, We are representing the word Madrid as a vector. You subtract the word Spain and you add France. You're going to get a vector really close to Paris, for example. <clears throat> what we do is we transform these sentences, the text in vectors, which are mathematical representations for text functions any kind of representation, and they're localized in vectoral spaces, which is an abstraction, and it's hard to be to imagine that we are working with uh, large dimension space vectors. We are working with uh, over 700 dimensions. In the real world, it's three dimensions, no more than that. If two texts are located close to each other in the space, we say the texts are similar. We have made this implementation. This is not just the, the research in computer science that analyzes the accuracy of these algorithms and how they are correct to analyze text similarity. We also do this in a tool so that the results of the research can uh, go beyond the academic world and be used on a daily basis by journalists who are in the forefront verifying data. We implemented this architecture, which is reusable. We can easily use this in different languages or different algorithms of similarity, which is integrated not just to our software, but others as well. Everything that we develop is shared with as free software, open code available to anyone. I'm going to show you two results to go empirical. Uh, I am moving towards the end of this presentation. Next slide. The first one is how on the left it appears in the software. We have content that was received through a verifying check bot on WhatsApp. We created here in the left column the area for it, and we have grouped all the other similar texts 
to this one that has been previously checked. All these checkings on the right, uh, there was no need for uh, checking because the content had been identified as similar. On the right, we see how it appears for the user on WhatsApp and the checking bot when the user submits information. In this example, I sent a question. The first minister of Belgium pretended to take the COVID shot. You send this to the bot. The question doesn't get into lines to be checked because automatically the algorithm will identify there's a, an existing checking on this question it will give me back a card the image verified saying that it's fake and we always ask the user if this answers the question of the user or not we can collect feedback from people and continue improving the tool and the algorithms behind it with that, I conclude my presentation and we can discuss a bit more at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Caio. Now, the floor, Lillian, to talk about her work. A front that we are paying increasingly more attention increasingly more important, has a direct connection with two themes that we are talking about. The floor is yours. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Lupa, for the opportunity and the brilliant work that he has been developing over time. In these two research we call V, we have just seen mine is an arm an, an arm of action in education it, it has this multiplying factor we believe each student is a multiplying agent and this way we can develop a week what we call active citizenship my research is in the educational field where the focus of it is to understand the educational resource and the educational resource that I try to understand in a totality is the so-called okay. massive only uh, it's a massive course which is free of charge I am a professor at a public school these educational resources which are open are really dear to public education it's really important for us to have increasingly more open and available resources in the PhD I started working with the understanding of this educational resource and within a media education uh, standpoint, which I've been doing in multi-literacy programs. So this program has the potential. It's a way of uh, distance teaching in a non-formal context. So anyone can take it. It's indicated these open courses are indicated in the context we are increasingly talking more about, which is learning over the timeline. Education is not ended in the formal context of high school or a gra uh, graduation. We have to learn how to learn, and these courses will get into this new era of communication as a mechanism that favors this context. 
That is why we have this flexibility. It's online. You may access the MOOC platform or one that's specifically made on your cell phone, tablet, not just the computer. Within this issue of understanding the online courses, whether the disorder of information as a context, my challenge is to develop this MOOC with what's favorable to promote media literacy. What are the main features for a course to promote the media literacy? And then build or contribute with the knowledge and contents on methodologies, strategies of teaching, which are more proper to promote media literacy, which is uh, media education, which is, you know, getting citizens of the online era. Uh, so it's a triad. The context is the disorder of information, the context that Ana Regina opened this uh, round the table with. I'm not going to talk much about that. The online course has come as an instrument, as a resource that will make it possible to promote media literacy. The idea is to promote media literacy and not as much thinking of the psychology of education, but the development of uh, competencies and the skills. So it's the first focus is to promote media literacy. Does this person online who has never heard of it to have the possibility to do it? There's uh, more theory uh, as you go to make the person develop skills, but the main focus is to promote and not the development of the skills. All of this, how do I develop this research in the education field? There are a lot of different methodologies to research as in any field, and the methodology I am using is educational design research. Here in Brazil, we have something close to that, which is the methodology of development. It's that thinking of the educational design, how am I going to create, how am I going to do curatorships of educational resources? Within that, I do a confluence with the perspective of the theory of elasticity from power trade. There are studies on the MOOC that show that many times the first ones, the second generation of, of MOOCs are closed courses where the student sees the video, responds to the quiz, and he doesn't have interaction. And there are other types of books. The, the first type, which is the connectivist, where he has lots of information, he receives lots of information, and many times he cannot organize all that. If we are in the disorder of information, we must increasingly more promote resources that help be able to make an, a narrative, for me to outline a narrative of all the information that I am receiving. Within that, I have to look for, first of all, what would be the best way of this course. There are many different typologies of courses. So this is the first stage of the research. The first stage of the research was a bibliography review of 1,500 entries. I came to 69 entries at the end of trying to understand what is the best way, what is the best type of this type of course. And I selected and created a framework that I discovered that it would be a social MOOC, and this is going to be done through social media which is precisely where we have today the greatest way of misinformation because of the range of things that social media can promote. The second 
stage of the research was the validation of this prototype of MOOC, which was done in the third stage was the implementation in the actual context. That said, we call the educational design research, which are interactions to be able to prove this educational mechanism. Of course, it doesn't end in a stage. It can continue over our lives, in, in my case, my, my researching life. But as a research cut, it ends in the third stage. I am about to wrap it up. My wrap up. The MOOC, it's done in a context of media education for social media, having as a center Instagram and Instagram. I invite you all, if you're curious, to follow me on the networks. If you have any questions on the research, you can also send an email. And of course, you're all invited to be part of this online course that we are promoting in this context of instigating education. I thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for your speech. I think it complements the other two. I would like now to get into the second moment of our panel with the questions, our debate. Before, I'd like to make a comment, something that caught my eye. We're always discussing here in the researchers in the different areas, but they always talk about technology. And I think it's interesting to be able to look at technology from a logistics standpoint. Uh, that's what Anna Regina was talking about. Uh, some of the social media, the platforms that convert these insecurities that we have in our behaviors and the potentiality of technology that can be seen, like Caio says, he shows his research on how the application of the computer science can make uh, the life of verifiers easier. Maybe in, in the future of everyone, the society as a whole, to fight misinformation. So to give you a background and enrich the way we see these all these problems, the technologies can be positive or negative. They, they are tools, and we have to know how to use them the best possible way. I would like to open asking a first question to Ana Regina, which is, what would be the information tactics more usual, you know, more used to make people to understand or to perceive that content as reliable, as something that they, they must, you know, uh, trust and so on. So how do you see that, Professor Ana Regina? Oh, uh, thanks, Victor. Thanks, Victor. I, my volume was, was off. Well, with your question, I can see a process in how we see ourselves in the world. How do we exist in the world and how this is explored? One uh, side that is very explored is affection, sociability, you know, the emotional uh, issues that comes through narratives, speeches, which preach something that is actually part of the social environment. So the strategy, this different uh, aesthetics or layout. For example, if you go to YouTube, that in Brazil is considered a depository 
or some sort of stock of information. Everything is there. Everything is on YouTube. I mean, if you go to YouTube and what happened now, and you're going to have an, an avalanche of videos, productions, content, and if you put extra, 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 you're going to see something there with this uh, looks, with so many headlines, with so many uh, uh, different contents. There's an audio that really reaches the emotional side of people. So there is a, there is a pattern uh, which uses behavioral psychology and intuition, but there, it, it, it's thought, I mean, the way they compose those narratives is professionalized and they try not to let that narrative be completely fraud, a fraud. There's something that is near the fact in order for you to be reliable, trustworthy, and then being close to this information, they really want uh, to show that that author is somebody that you could trust. You know what I mean? And then in Brazil, I mean, the how people express their affection in Brazil, where the misinformation is more uh, fruitful. App messages, I mean, mess messages apps like WhatsApp and now Telegram, they are the biggest uh, places where uh, people can make groups. And then some groups are even family groups, as we all know. And then by being family members and so on, they really take advantage on that. All the type of groups are the religious groups because they, they, they kind of like create channels, you know, infos, and they do that, that they promote that menu of information, you know. Church, the church, you know, people don't really like to talk bad about the word of God, so they believe the word of God. And then these religious groups take advantage on that to disseminate messages. So somebody that is there representing God so, of course, you respect that message, you respect that information, and they really exploit that, you know, something that is uh, intentional ignorance or ignorance madness, if you will. Some people choose not to know. Some people choose, uh, uh, even though they know that, that the information is fake, they choose to trust it, they choose to believe in it. There are so many processes going on in Brazil right now, and our challenge as journalists is huge because misinformation works with many uh, dimensions and many domains. I mean, living in society, that's uh, how it is. I mean, there is a, uh, there are challenges all the time and try to really pretty much um, mitigate that in all the dimensions, you know, because misinformation is everywhere in all sectors and all the dimensions. And the misinformation market or these people that really have the bad intention of, of, of really creating that type of misinformation, especially against uh, science and so on, or making things very polarized to provoke misunderstanding, to provoke fights, you know, you know, so uh, they really try to keep a society ignorant. I don't know if I answered your question, but that's that's all I had to say. Oh, great, Professor. Thank you for your contribution. I'd like to pass the word to 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 Lily. Well, speaking about media literacy, we understand that this is uh it's being disseminated i mean and our colleagues we we agree but media literacy is not uh so accessed yet because i, I don't know uh, not everybody's aware of that 
And Lina, I'd like to ask you, since you work with children in Nova Iguaçu, you know, in, in schools there, I'd like to know from you how this works. Is there an adhesion from the schools, from the curriculum of these schools? Uh, do they adhere to media literacy? Of course, not absolutely, not totally. But are they still resistant or are they interested in actually making things feasible, making media literacy part of their, um, you know, curricul curriculums? What, what do you, how do you see that? Well, let me just see if my audio is, is working. Yes, it is. In Brazil, we don't have a legislation or some specific plan about media literacy. If we compare to other countries, there are rules and regulations of their ministries of education, especially in Europe. They, they do this work a lot. So the media education is everywhere in the curriculum, in their programs. So, uh, you know, journalism and everything brings up the debate and it happens The teachers, teachers are there to take some actions. So that goes beyond the teachers formation or graduation. Of course, us as teachers, we don't have a total information uh, towards media literacy. Of course not. Because in education, we don't talk about media education. We talk about multi-literacy. Multi-literacy, you know, in that, under that pers perspective, of course it covers media literacy or media education, but that goes beyond our uh, formation. We need public policies that at the end, we have resources to make this debate happen. Because the school itself, you know, the school system, it is an open space for citizenship. Teachers, professors, they're there open to bring citizenship and criticism. So this critical education, which is strong in Brazil, I must say, we do have critical education is as part of our action methodology. So that's strong in Brazil because of Paulo Freire uh, legacy. And it makes us develop that even though that teacher never heard uh, media literacy or media education, maybe even if he's not so familiar with, with that terminology, because literacy is still not so used. You know, we don't use literacy, but we use um, something similar, but not quite in, in the Portuguese language. It kind of seems that education is not even dealing with that, but that's just terminology. We do have that. We do have actions. We have external actions in partnership with other companies and institutions and the teachers in their daily practices. As I see in my daily uh, professional routine, I mean, my research is not about the classroom life, but uh, me, myself, as a teacher for so many years, I see that, yes, this is actually in the classroom, but what we need, what we lack in our country is specific public policies for media education. And there are so uh, a fact, simple as the access to internet. I mean, seriously, media education without a school with connection, with internet connection, I mean, that is a problem. The teachers really use whatever they have to make that reality happen. It's the reality in education in Brazil is very heterogeneous. There are gaps. There are 
schools that they don't even have cell phones, smartphones, I mean, schools. I mean, internet access uh, is an effort that so many teachers have to do because they don't, the schools don't even make the internet available to teachers to their, for, their, for them to even plan their classes. So schools are actually marginal, you know what I mean? They are uh, far from digital studies. And uh, that really makes us not able to really open up about media education, about immersion and so on. So the school lacks resources to even promote that immersion. There, there is a lack of resources. There is a lack of public uh, policies. So that makes things not happen. Thank you, Professor. I'd like to ask a question to Kyle. Of course, uh, that uh, we know that we are going to have elections this year and all the platforms, websites, contents produced, they have a strategic role throughout this process. And I'd like to ask Caio about technology and technology development. You know, according to the, your studies, your research, Caio, uh, have you been seeing anything in, I don't know, applying these methodologies, these technologies in these platforms, for instance? You know, WhatsApp, which is the main one. I mean, we use WhatsApp so much. You know what I mean? How do you use these methodologies? How do you guys, developers, how do you guys think technology and how can we how can we really use well when we speak about apply, applying these solutions in the platforms it's important to separate things in two ways the messages apps there is something that makes things hard which is the cryptography end to end. The final message is available to the sender and to the receivers. And that makes things difficult, makes things harder. So the action of the platforms about private message apps is very limited, their actions, because the reach of the messages is hindered by, by cryptography. So there are controls such as to limit to how many uh, people that message can be disseminated or sent and to limit the number of people that can be members of a, a such group and so on. And also uh, the, these, the users of the platforms, they can actually uh, take some messages that uh, I don't know that, that they want to be available anymore. So Lupa is doing this to that is checking if that message is uh, true or false. Those search platforms and they can even tag or they can even uh, really uh, uh, say that it's, that message was sent or not. Well. A single signature to each message. So we should create that single signature that uh, doesn't reveal the content of that message. So it doesn't really break the cryptography of that, but it shows how much that message is being shared and what does that message do. So we can limit how much a message can be shared or how many people that message can even reach or maybe even tag 
those messages that are having a larger or broader reach, but it limits uh, the users. So it's, it's important to have really partnership with uh, other uh, platforms. It's something that has to be done in cooperation with the others. And in the middle of all that, the users. The users have been aware that when they, I mean, warned that when they receive that kind of message, they should question the veracity of that message. Speaking about final users, of course. But since we've been debating in this round table, there are messages that are disseminated, that are spread out massively, and there is a methodology that does that. They do that a lot. And uh, it's important to limit the number of people that, that those messages can reach, a single message can reach. So. There are two groups, private message apps because of cryptography, so that really limits our power. And then when we speak about the web itself, you know, internet itself, that is a little bit more feasible because the content is available there. Of course, there is a URL that uh, locates that content, of course, so then we have a little bit more flexibility, more freedom to use these tools, these analysis tools. Thank you, Kai. I'd like to see if you guys uh, have any questions. Otherwise, we're going towards the end of our panels. I don't know if you guys have any extra um, things that you'd like to talk about? Anything to add? Professor Anna Regina. I'd just like to make an observation. You know, interaction among the speeches. And when we talk about misinformation, dimensions, different dimensions. Well, media education, for instance, as we see, especially within the national uh, network for misinformation fighting, the countries that invest more money in that, in communication with media and so on, there are countries in which misinformation is less effective. So I think that we, have high expectations, thinking of our future, thinking about this horizon ahead of us with all the partners that work with this, especially with Professor Lillian. And the other dimension that Caio brings, the technology dimension, that we are actually inserted in the technological phenomena it's so important because there are other things going on. You know, there are other things actually uh, in the same flow and checking. We know that the technology has a big role of it, but Lupa works with uh, fact checking. That's the main product of Lupa agency. And we believe that uh, check the journalism of checking, you know, done by human beings is powerful and it's strong but as we know everything is multiple everything goes both ways so we have to walk together with the media education with scientific education fact checking entities journalism and researchers and computing science and so on, you know, AI uh, experts, psychologists, and so on, people that work with behavioral uh, psychology, we have to really check and see what, what's happening all together because uh, for the observer that it's a little bit far, 
you know, he receives three speeches, three speeches coming from different environments. No, we are integrated. We are all in the same environment and this synergy and the understanding one another is key. This is, was just a comment that I had. Thank you for the time. Yes, uh, now we try to really put these things together in order to make things stronger, understanding that uh, we, we have to fight misinformation, but we, we cannot go only one way or alone. No, we have to embrace ourselves and go all together uh, because it's a big uh, phenomenon. I mean, misinformation is huge. As we know, anybody else would like to compliment? I'd like to say that well, we have multidisciplinary discussions. We from computer science, we focus a lot on technical issues. It's really interesting when we have broader discussions. It convinces increasingly more that it's it's a discussion of distinguished areas, and it's a very complex problem that comes from different parts of it. So making a parallel with the health issues which are so connected with misinformation, they have been over the pandemic. As we say, the virus contaminates and inf information uh, viralized, the fight must come this way. We try to prevent with education. I particularly think it's the solution in the long run when it's not possible to prevent we try to fight it and technology tries to limit the reach and try to tries to optimize the fact checking so making this parallel because we with the pandemic we created a term infomania this snowball of information that spread so fast as as well as a virus with the uh, harmful impacts perfect so we are moving towards the end on behalf of lupa i would like to congratulate you for your comments all your uh, work your research the fight against misinformation and thank you professor Anna. Caio, for being here with us. This event was held by Hex Hackers in Lupa. This first edition being held in Brazil. It's a great pleasure to have been with you, with you here. Great pleasure to participate in this table. We hope to continue with the partnership with this network to more constant, consistently be able to advance in this fight against misinformation, producing science, uh, making, giving legitimacy to the production that it deserves in Brazil. So the floor is yours. Make a final comment. We'll see each other on the pro, uh, next opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. And thank you for meeting Lillian, Caio. I will get in touch with you. The network has 45 partners, but the idea is to have as many as possible. Millions of networks just like ours. The more people we have, the more we're going to be able to lessen the effects of this really complex phenomenon. Namaste, it was great being here. Greetings, Kai, Lillian, and all of you who, who were here with us on YouTube. I'd like to thank you all for the participation. I'm sorry. So thank you for the opportunity to discuss, hear, follow, 
other works done in other disciplines. I am anxious to see you again in a next opportunity and keep on working on these fronts, helping in whatever is possible. Thank you all. See you next time. Thank you all, Professor Ana, Caio, Vitor, Alexandre Lupa. I invite you all to this media education movement through critical thinking. Never stop thinking. Never stop researching and informing yourself. Only through these actions we can fight misinformation. Thank you once again, wrapping up the academic panel at misinfo.com, held by hacks, Hackers Lupa. Now, easy with our, our event continues in the afternoon. I hope you are enjoying this moment of so many rich talks. People well prepared to talk about misinformation in the country. I invite you to follow the full program. Thank you. See you next time. Marcela, what a nice chat. So interesting to see the fight against misinformation. We started more with journalism, the elections. We are closing it. The morning edition with a different side, which is essential which is media literacy uh, in schools, the, the critical thinking that is so necessary. Yes, that's so necessary. It's so nice to finish this with academic immersion. I thank you all for, for the, uh, those who participate in the academic immersion. Louise, this is all about what we've been working with. We cannot work in a single front. We must tackle many different fronts if we want to fight misinformation in Brazil. It's interesting to remind you recently in the new side, this is all connected. Lupa sees itself as a hub to fight misinformation in many different fronts. We have two main pillars, education and journalism. It's on the website. I invite you all to take a look at their new website and also uh, the program of misinformation.com. Uh, it's important for you to understand that being a hub to fight misinformation is to promote this collective effort of different solutions to fight misinformation, but not Lupa as the holder of the fight. No, we are an instrument. We're instrumenting people for them to be able to understand how they can act to fight misinformation. So we invite you to take a look at our website. It's a wonderful site. I love institutional sites. Um, and there you can have more transparency on Agência Lupa. You can understand our methodology, how Lupa finances itself, what are the solutions, a little bit of the, uh, the whole. If you uh, bought a ticket for the later parts today of our event, uh, the, by the end of the day, we have the idea to strengthen this transparency answer, what people always talk about Lupa, question Lupa about, and bring to people answers, what Lupa is and how we are working. What does it mean to have education field, journalism field? How do we do our fact checking? The methodology of the tags. This is the moment for us to talk more about ourselves and to listen what people have to say about us. We have a workshop really soon. Yes, our presidential chat. We're going to be here, everyone uh, in Rio by the end of the day. But before those who got the tickets at two, we're going to have the workshop on how to check uh, information on the elections. And at 4 p.m., the second workshop, media elections on the election, all connected with everything we've been talking about in the several different fronts. Loop is working to fight this information. I want to thank Hacks Hackers on relying on Lupa to, to hold 
uh, Misinfocom in Brazil. It's a global movement that brings solutions on fact checking uh, to fight misinformation and other things related to this uh, work front. So, Hacks Hackers, thank you so much for relying on us, for choosing Lupa to hold the Brazilian edition. Uh, greetings, Ahmed. Uh, and it's really important for us to have these partners, for us to be able to promote events like these. Event, Marcela, my message, a lot of people who are working, uh, who are seeing us already work with this, let's do more events like these. Uh, let's take the debate to places where lots of times people are not heard. The challenge of fact checking when we do speeches uh, people ask, how do you get to someone in the countryside who doesn't have access to social network, doesn't have access to the fight against misinformation? If, like academic uh, emerging, if we take the subject to different spheres and provide critical thinking, we are closer to our mission. Right. This is essential for us at Lupa as a hub to fight misinformation. We are commenting the debate on misinformation. This is so important. It's a way of creating awareness. We work with the fact-checking of journalism, education, but also in this type of event, we have this need to sensitize people. Well, I want to thank the Hex Hackers, our partners, and I hope that uh, if we put a bit of inspiration in some other companies to create events like this. Uh, in, a, in the year of elections, it's essential for us to debate misinformation and the fight against misinformation. Excellent. I want to thank you, first of all, you who were here since 9 a.m., you who were here just for the first panel, or if you watch this, the second panel, or just the academic version, thank you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for sharing uh, with Brazil about us. Thank you for investing some time in the, to act uh, about this. We highlight this live broadcast is available. As we finish this video, it's going to be ava available for anyone who wants to watch it. You can share the link. You can spread Misinfocon to your networks. If you want to use the hashtag, it's a hashtag Misinfocon Brazil. Enjoy it, share it, comment, do whatever you think is necessary for us to be able to build the fight against misinformation and to have a more critical society. This is the end. Yes, the end of this part of the morning. And there's more to come in the afternoon workshops. At 2, Natalia Afonso waits for you. And at 4 p.m., Rafael Capa and Dominique wait for you in the second workshop. And Marcelo and I and the entire Lupa team will wait for you uh, at the presidential event. I am going to be there and Marcella will be answering lots of questions. Okay, the responsibility is mine, right, Luis? I am, if you don't engage, I am preparing lots and lots of questions. Okay, thank you guys. Have a great day, great afternoon, great evening. See you next time at the next MissInfoCon.